Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode four of Befriending the Internet, the show where I answer questions and talk about things pertaining to the thoughts on my mind and experiences I've been going through and reflections on my past that are constantly racing through my mind as I, uh, you know, go through a gender transition experience and smoke lots and lots of weed and watch lots of anime and talk to lots of people and uh i i've been having so many thoughts lately it's been like difficult to figure out like if I, if i want to incorporate more of the random stuff i think about into this show or if i want this to strictly be about answering questions because there are a lot of questions and I want to get through them all. So I'm planning to create another show and ultimately I think that there are going to be four types of content on this channel that I want to be very clearly marked because I think one of the biggest problems that I've had on this channel throughout its whole history is that uh, it's often unclear what something is until you click on it. And there's a few reasons for this, one of which is that I never really did format content because I have ideas for things in so many different styles, even if it's only subtle differences, like something being more of a review or more of an analysis or more of just a quick point about a show or something that's more holistic, like, it's hard to communicate what type of thing it's going to be if it's not so easy to classify. Um, you know, in just the title and branding of the video. So, you know, with, uh, with these new ones that I'm going to do, I want to have very distinct categories without removing the ability to cover a lot of ground. Because even though I want to do projects in more fields than just YouTube, I am not trying to dedicate myself to primarily being a YouTuber. I do have tons and tons and tons and tons of ideas for YouTube videos all the time. The amount of YouTube videos that I produce do not represent even a fraction of the amount that I have ideas for. And that's not even talking about like, you know, stuff that like actually makes it to the stage of working on it, of which I'd say probably two thirds of stuff that I actually start working on gets completed. Um, and that other third is stuff that, you know, could reach all kinds of different stages. But, like, when I say reaching a stage of being worked on, I mean, like, actually pen to paper, you know, fingers to keyboard, something is being written or, uh, you know, something is in the editing bay, you know. So, like, I would say that, um, you know, if I want to get other things done and still have these ideas be like utilized in any way then the most effective way to do that would be to have some sort of show where I just like rattled off all the half finished or like ideas that just can't become videos because they're it's like the ideas that I have for how to make these things into good videos are too complex. Like, for instance, like, let's say, uh, I have written down here in my notes, um, Savage and Danny California. So these are two songs that I heard on the radio and was like having thoughts about their lyrics that I thought would be interesting to share on a show. But like, there's nowhere really that it makes sense to put them. Like, they don't really, it doesn't really make sense to do it on this show. And, like, when I think about, oh, what if I did, like, a lyrics analyzed show where, like, I, you know, every once in a while collect some lyrics and, like, talk about them uh, and put them on screen and do, like, a semi edited thing. And it's like, that would literally take enough time that it wouldn't be worth doing for me because of the amount of time it would take away from other things. So, like, this has been the problem with my YouTube career is that I've always been trying to do too many different things and I want all of them to have an equal opportunity to be the best that they can be, but there's just not enough time in the world for that to be possible for every single idea. So it's like, how do I narrow it down so that only the things that people really want me to do, like people come to me for, 
uh, actually have like that extra time and care put into them. Whereas all that other stuff can still exist in some form without having to take up too much of my time. So I want to do a show that's just called something like Scraps. Uh, and that will be just like any, like I'll literally read off like half finished scripts or, or like scripts where I wrote the first section and that pretty much was all the ideas I actually had and wanted to get off my chest. And then I realized I didn't have to make the rest of a big project or, you know, or like, uh, things that became overscoped or even just ideas that have been on my mind. I mean... You know, I used to do a lot of uh, Let's Plays and stuff, and I might do more kind of stuff like that with May, more stuff that is like this uh, with her, um, so that I can, you know, discuss some of these topics that are on my mind, or I'll just continue to go on her show. If you don't know, uh, my fiance May, has a live stream show that she does twice a week on the Corrupting Your Kids channel, um, and it usually goes on for hours and hours. It has callers. Uh, through a Discord. There's a whole Discord. It's fucking massive. Um, she's really launching her own YouTube career, uh, which is more of a streaming thing combined with doing like occasional YouTube videos. Um, whereas I'm going in the direction of like <sighs> streaming is like it's fun for me to be in somebody else's stream. It's not fun for me to stream for myself. So. Like, I enjoy just getting to, like, guest on her dream stream every once in a while and promote it. But, like, I'm not very... I don't have fun running my own streams. I find it too stressful. There's too many technical details to keep track of. Um, and I, I obsessively read the chat and try to respond to absolutely everything. And then I end up being way behind in the chat. So it's just, like, I prefer to be more passive and not have to actually be in control of the situation. And really, that's a, a, a strong summary of... My personality in general is that somebody I'm, I'm somebody who has tasked myself to take charge a lot because of the fact that I am good at figuring out what needs to be done. And I am good at telling people what they need to do, but I am not good at getting things done myself. I am very good at delegation. I am not very good at like taking action because I always have too many fucking ideas like I have too many different elements in mind and like it's funny because I, I wanted to be like my career choice idea I just realized I need the morph ball and I don't have it uh, that uh, that I wanted to do when I was a teenager was to be a director and I really had little concept of what a director actually does at the time but I, I have come to realize that like more so than a director, I think I would be a good producer. Like, what I am good at is figuring out who needs to do what together. You know, like, who would ben what what people would benefit from being connected to one another or being connected to me and what kind of projects people can work on well together. Who can be friends with one another, you know? Like, that's the kind of stuff which, which ultimately, in my mind, is, is essentially social manipulation. But, like... It's something you can do with people's best interest in mind and working with them to understand what their best interests are, you know, like, and so, I mean, I'm going to go into more detail about this. Um, I've got another video I'm going to make about uh, connecting to myself through anime characters uh, that I'll probably record right after this. So before I get too distracted and start going down that train of thought, um, you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the format of the channel going forward. So I've talked about the idea that there will be the uh, there will be the show um, Otagonzo Tapes, which is my anime analysis show that I want to start publishing on a weekly basis. It's kind of been everything's kind of been in hiatus for the last like month or so since I came out, just because I've been trying to personally navigate like what exactly my life is becoming um while also like really slowly getting a sense of like not only people's expectations of me as a content creator but also like what i should task myself to do um you know in order to like fulfill myself and also get things done and like uh, I think that my, my biggest problem is I want to do too many things and most of those things are not necessarily worth doing or I won't 
I won't finish them because everything gets overscoped. So if we can keep this simple, then it will be like my YouTube channel should just be like autopilot because that's the way YouTube is meant to be run. Like everybody who has a successful YouTube channel has a format. They have a formula. They do the same thing. It's plug and play. And it's always been difficult for me to find a formula that actually works for somebody who is trying to do a billion different things at once. So what are the billion different things I want to do? Well, on the one hand, I want to be an anime analysis guy because I personally am just deeply, deeply invested in anime as a medium, um, and I have a ton of knowledge about it, and I've got a reputation as somebody who knows things about it. And I think it's easy for me to connect with, like, why people like anime even when it's something I don't like. It's easy for me to explain to other people, like, like draw comparisons because I have a huge pool of reference and uh, that's what makes it so you know my ability to talk about those that stuff is more relatable like when I talk about video games it's less relatable to people because I make more esoteric connections and I can't explain myself as well because I'm not as into video games and I don't play as many of the popular games as most people whereas with anime I you know I know I keep up with everything I, I know what's going on at least enough that I can always be a part of the conversation and, and never be out of touch. So, you know, that's why people value my takes on anime specifically, even if they might not be interested in my takes on a lot of other things or not interested in my personal life uh, because, you know, they might not connect with my experiences enough to get anything about hearing about my personal life. And that's totally understandable. So the Otsuganzo tapes is the show in which I will talk about anime. And, uh, you know, it's, it is a format that makes sense for me to pretty like it's it's very flexible um it it pretty much allows for any type of writing but the way that i'm handling it is that there's a basically a hard line rule of nothing has to be holistic it's write a script the second you have um an idea that can have a script written about it so like for instance aradagi and senjo gahara like i started a rewatch of the monogatari series um you know, after the first, like, five or six episodes, I had a thesis that I felt was, you know, proven at, about at least that section of the show that I could, you know, study the characters in this context and say something interesting about them. And uh, thus, I just did that. And so I did not wait until I had finished Monogatari again to write a seven-hour video. I just, you know, uh, played the first thing that came to my head, if you will. So, uh... Yeah, from there, um, it's like, okay, so that's that's a way to take care of doing, like, anime videos that can come out regularly and have some, like, depth in that they're all, like, none of them are just going to be, like, a review. I'm not interested in that kind of thing. I don't really want to talk about shows I don't like anymore because I don't really want to watch shows I don't care about anymore. Like, my goal is to talk about, to, like, go back through shows and explore them in greater and greater depth. Uh, you know, that that have richness to them. N because shows that are bad are all bad in the same ways. And I've already talked about the ways that shows are bad. And I'm not really interested in, like, dissecting, like, what makes one particular show uniquely terrible. Like, I don't want to have to watch a bad show. I'd rather literally just rewatch a good shit or watch all the stuff I've been meaning to get around to and talk about why it's interesting. And uh, introduce people to some older stuff that they might not have heard of, you know. Um, and if that, you know, doesn't appeal to as many people, then so be it. Like, I, you know, casting a wide net and getting people who are into, like, Shield Hero or uh, whatever, you know, that was, like, the last, like, semi-popular flavor of the week thing that I kind of covered that I could remember. Uh, or even, like... You know, Arrow Manga Sensei, and, like, I will be doing stuff with Nate on the Canton uh, channel where we just do, like, discussions of whatever are, like, the, the couple of most popular current shows, uh, but not on this channel, just because it's easier for me to do that kind of thing when I'm doing it with somebody else where we could just, like, uh, Nate's moving down to Virginia Beach soon, so, like, we could literally hang out, watch the shows, and then just talk about them on in front of a green screen. And uh, that's, like, a totally different thing from me having to sit down and fucking, you know, contemplate how I'm going to set things up and write a script and all that shit by myself, you know? Um, and then 
tiredly drag my ass in front of a camera instead of doing the billion other things I could do with my time, uh, you know, while I'm at my computer. So, uh, so yeah, the content channel will be the only place that I talk about, like, current or relevant things, probably. But here on the Digibro channel, I'm going to be, you know, watching my favorite anime, figuring out what's cool about them, writing scripts as I, as, as I feel the need. And uh, the Patreon will be dedicated to the Otaganzo tapes and I think possibly also the Befriending the Internet show. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that because this show, aside from this very long intro where I'm explaining the format from this point forward, is going to be just answering questions. Because again, there's plenty of questions. It's plenty interesting to answer them. I like having a show that is just specifically dedicated to community engagement. And it streamlines that a lot because it means that Everybody will know how to reach me. You leave something in the comments of the Befriending the Internet show, you can guarantee I'm going to read these comments, and that if I have a response, you know, it will appear on the show. So, like, you know, um, I'm also trying to, you know, make it so I'm more reachable through social media. Uh, because I'm doing this show now, I have immediately become less reachable because I am now more reachable through this show is making me less reachable through other shows by uh, virtue of how much time I'm putting into this show. But I, this is not going to be daily. I mean, I've already this one has uh, I've waited a couple days because um, I also recorded some other shit. I mean, I, I recorded episode one of Scraps, the third show, which will be, again, just random concepts and ideas. Uh, because it was, I was trying to record this episode of this show while playing Breath of the Wild, and instead I went on for 90 minutes about the introductory topic I was going to discuss. So that really didn't work out. Um, and that became episode one of Scraps, uh, which I was already planning to do. So that will probably come out after this. I'm also planning to record a big-ass video, again, that I mentioned. Maybe it'll come out before this one. I'm not sure. About uh, how I relate to all these anime characters that I put on this big chart. Anyway, without further ado, we really need to start. Oh, also, actually, with <laughs> more further ado, I because I have some notes here. One, I was going to tell people... Uh, I would re greatly appreciate it if you read the description on each of these videos. Some of it will be, like, copy-pasted between them. But, um, you know, it, it does contain any kind of updates and information. I'm going to make sure that, like, anything I've done recently is accounted for. Again, like, I really want it to be that this video series, Befriending the Internet, is how I connect with you and communicate with you. So... Uh, I want the description to explain, like, if I did any videos with other people recently, if, uh, which I did, two of, um, that will be linked down there. If, uh, you know, there's any instructions on maybe, like, a contest I'm doing or if I'm selling something, I don't know. I'll just, I'll have notes down there, um, to anything that, uh, that I think is interesting for you to know. And I also want to encourage you to read the other comments on these videos. If you are somebody who is leaving comments... There are so many amazing, long, meaningful comments. You know, aside from the ones that I read on the show that have questions, there are other ones that I answer by responding to the comments directly or ones that uh, are just, like, really interesting and relatable to me as well. So, uh, you know, I would encourage you, get involved in the community. Meet some of these people. There's a lot of comments that are from people who are talking about that, you know, they are... Uh, you know, lonely and looking for people to talk to who, who, who feel similarly to them. And I'm like, well, there's a whole lot of you in here, you know, so uh, make friends with each other. This is a community. Um, anyway, also another thing is I'm considering, like, just turning off ads on these videos because I legitimately get, like, triggered by watching ads at all. Um, like, I freak the fuck out when I have to see an ad. It, like, makes me enraged, uh, particularly on YouTube. I've always used ad blocker. I used a Brave browser. And, uh, recently they changed... YouTube changed something that is making it so the ads are getting past Brave's shields. I'm sure I could install, like, a supplementary ad blocker or something or use a different, um, use a different browser. But, like... It's really obnoxious, and somebody told me that there was a ad for some, like, 
fucking conservative university or something appearing on one of my videos and they were like asking if there was a way for me to turn it off which i don't think there is like i looked i can't find any way to remove what ads appear in your videos so that's super fucking weird um and uh like i was putting on like unskippable video ads because okay like i'll level with you guys i will explain the ad game i don't play the ad game on youtube and like yes i have ads on my videos I make so much less money than I would if I did it the way that other people do. Because the ad breaks in the videos. Like, so every ad that you watch is worth the same amount. So if somebody puts three ad breaks in a video, they literally make three times as much money. And YouTube is three times as likely to promote their video because it will make them three times as much money to show you three times as many ads. And I do not put mid-roll ad breaks in my videos because I can't fucking stand them. And I know people are watching this shit on mobile and I just have an imagination in my head of you like scrambling to your phone to try to fucking hit the skip button on the ad because that's what I would be doing. And I don't want to do that to you. Like these are meant to be meditative experiences. Like it's fine to watch an ad at the start of the video because you haven't started the video yet or at the end of the video I usually put end roll ads on them as well because you're transitioning between two videos It's just like a commercial break, right? But like I Personally would not sit through the ads and my mentality has always been well Let the people who can stand them sit through them and everybody else use an ad blocker. I encourage it I'm not going to complain if you use an ad blocker on my videos because I would do the same um you know, if you want to support me, you could do so through paying me through whatever other means, you know, direct PayPal donation. I don't necessarily, uh, you know, I have a Patreon. I rely on Patreon. I do not love Patreon as a platform, but, uh, you know, you can give me money through there as well. But like, you know, I leave the ads up because it is free money from the people who do watch the ads and I make like a thousand dollars a month that way. But like, Again, it's like, that's good money that I like making, but, like, if people were like, hey, I will literally give you money if you turn off the ads, I would be like, let me turn off the ads. Now, I think that there's a lot of people who like having the ads as a means of support who cannot give money, and let me tell you. I would much rather you not watch the ad than try to give me money that way because you are giving me a amount, an, an amount of money that is not worth your mental space at all. Like, I care way more about you not watching the ad than I care about the money I will make from the ad because I don't want you to poison your fucking mind watching this ad. In fact, I've just convinced myself to turn off these ads. Anyways, although I know this is a reckless move that I shouldn't be doing because my Patreon is already on the decline, but, like, um, I just hate ads so fucking much. I don't know. You tell me. Tell me if I should keep them on or turn them off. Uh, I just hate the idea that people are being forced to watch ad I had, I fucking, the latest Vic and Hope video... I clicked on it and a fucking Joe Biden ad came up. I had to look at Joe Biden for the first time in like a month because presidential politics completely disappeared from my Twitter feed. Uh, it's been a beautiful time. But um, anyway, we're going to get to the questions now. The first one is from Idola Idolion who says, It's been strange to hear people comment on your voice. You've always had many voices, and your voice has always been changing. Thank you. I'm glad you noticed. Also, I often think there are a lot more trans people or people who would not identify as cis if there were more freedom about gender and open discussion about gender. More non-binary and trans representation in shows, I guess, is what I want. Though as a creator, I guess I tend to fall to the conclusion because I feel like it's an achievable goal for me to personally make the world better. I remember really relating to Krona back when Soul Eater was big. That might have been the first time I saw a character who presented something close to how I felt and still feel, and Krona still means a lot to me even if I'm not invested in Soul Eater much anymore. So I guess I would ask you and anyone else who wants to comment, what sort of trans characters do you want to see, or what kind of gender narratives do you appreciate most? Um, 
Great question. Uh, and I also loved Corona in Soul Eater for the same reason that I did relate to the uh, that particular portrayal of a non-binary experience. Um, I would say that, like, I mean, because I have a I have a novel that I'm working on. Um, essentially summarizing my own experience, and I've talked about the idea of it before in a previous form, um, but it was about a, a trans magical girl, uh, a, you know, uh, a map. What is it? How is it spelled? Mab, Bor- assigned male. Yeah, a map, tra- uh, a map magical girl, who um, you know, eventually transitions later in life. Uh, and, um, you know, that's essentially the novel I'm writing because it's just basically a metaphor for my own existence, obviously. But, uh, you know, that's something that would have connected with me personally as, like, I guess it's, you know, it's a character that I decided to create because I was kind of surprised that it didn't already exist. Um, and it took me a long time to figure out why I wanted to to create that character specifically uh and i think like you know my video about magical girls pretty much summarizes it so um you know i would say i mean any character that speaks to you is going to be one that speaks to somebody else like you know crona spoke to me as well even if it wasn't like quote unquote the answer you know um to to my experience so like you know whatever whatever is in your mind is just what I would go with because some people will connect with it even if it's not like exactly them anyway all right the next question is from Tetra who says this chunk has an actual question so it goes at the top the rest does not as far as valuing yourself and trusting others I end up in a weird middle ground people generally consider me nice and good but tend not to be all that fond of me like I'm everyone's most distant friend basically I got good at not being bad, but I never really worked out how to be good. Do you have any thoughts on that side of it? I do, because this is something I also struggled with. And it's so, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, like, um, where exactly I've been mistaken in my approach to communication over the years. And, like, when you say I got good at not being bad, like, when I think about what my bad habits are, it's that... I blame other people for not understanding what I'm trying to say, like at the core. And I know I get this from the fact that like, you know, I recent after I made the neurotyping chart, I had a conversation with my mom in which I asked her like, do you think in words at all? And she said, words, almost never. And it got me thinking about impressionistic thinking. Um, There's another question I'm probably going to answer in here, I think. Uh, where somebody talks about um, how women, uh, how I was saying that like men are more competitive. And he said, well, women are more competitive than men because they compare themselves to other women. Well, I agree with that, but I think there's a difference in the way that it tends to manifest. And it's not so much a men versus women thing as a emotional thinker versus, uh, you know, um, Well, not even that it's emotional thinking. I guess it's like the breadth of of the competition. Like if you're more of a social competitor or more of a like direct competitor. So what I mean by this is that like when, when you've got a group of guys together, everything that they do becomes a competition in that moment. It's like, hey... I bet you can't blank as much as I can blank, you know? And girls don't tend to be that way. They tend to be fixated on the holistic experience of, like, it's not about who did... It's not just, like, who looked the best at this event. It's, like, who looked the best and who were they with and what were they talking about and what's going on in their lives and like it's the whole picture of the person because you're not just trying to be you know you're not just trying to be better than them at the thing that you're doing you're trying to be better than them in general and like so i think i think of that as a different type of of competitiveness and it's really not like i think that if you are 
really insecure about yourself, then it manifests as like, oh, I have to like upstage other people and prove my worth, you know? But if you already feel a sense of self-worth and you don't, you know, like feel the sensation of like needing to be acknowledged by other people, like then you can, you can sort of compete not so much like not so much in the sense of like oh i want to be better than everybody but like i want to be the best person that i possibly can and so i'm going to look for the best role models like the people who i respect the most and try to emulate them you know and like just always keep myself in the mindset that like the best version of me is the one that's going to be like you know that, that, that like is able to achieve the things that the people who I look up to can achieve and not like not that I literally have to do what they do in you know it's, it's a good idea to to know about as many different people that you can look up to as possible so that you know all the different like possible ways that you can be useful you know it's like I I copied the styles of tons and tons of youtubers who I like you know thought okay, like, this, the way this guy writes, like, uh, if I talked about this game using that writing style, then I'll be able to talk about it, you know? And then, like, once I know how to write in that style a little bit, I can, like, incorporate it into what I do in the future, and eventually it becomes seamless, and you don't even notice, like, I don't even notice that I'm, you know, still still influenced by that person because it's just become a natural part of my, you know my writing or the way I speak or whatever. So like, you know, I, I think, uh, this basically feeds into the, uh, evolutionist adaptation video that, uh, that, that will also be coming out the first episode of scraps where I rant about that. But, uh, yeah. So, so how do you be good? Find people who you think are good and copy what they do. Um, I would say a big part of what has allowed me to start this series, to to start being more open with people and um, and even to come out, is uh, my friendship with Don Jolly and with his community Encyclopedia Dot Zone, because uh, Don Jolly is just an exceedingly good and nice person, who, you know, he is he's edgy in in his opinions because he's angry about the state of the world and uh you know and 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 bleak because you know he's seen how hopeless things can be but like ultimately is trying to be a force of good and to encourage like-minded individuals you know to 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 try and also be not only themselves happier but also to encourage each other and like his community is nothing but people encouraging each other all the time. It's people who are mad at the bad guys and nice to each other, you know? And the bad guys are clearly defined uh, as, like, you know, people who are really trying to fuck over the weak, you know, and the disenfranchised. Um, and uh, you know, keeping your eyes on the prize, on the big, the big true evils who need to be, you know, consistently called out, um, while encouraging the people who are on your side to like, you know, stay in the fight. And like, my my biggest mentor as a writer early into my career, you know, I say career, but this is before I was making money as a as an anime blogger was Ghost Lightning, who was somebody who literally responded to every single comment that he got on his blog, even if it was stupid, because he was always interested in engaging with people and trying to, you know, bring them in and and make them understand. And like, I super looked up to that, but I didn't really understand how to copy it at the time because like when I read like a comment that doesn't understand me and I can't understand why they didn't understand me, then I'm just like kind of angry and confused, especially if they're being aggressive, you know? And it's like, it's hard for me not to respond to aggression with aggression in kind. Um, and sometimes it's warranted to do that to some extent, but like, 
it should not be taken as an act of aggression that somebody doesn't understand you or even that they're not particularly trying to understand you because they might just not have the energy or wherewithal to exert themselves. And in some ways, the fact that they're trying to engage with you at all is a cry for help. It is definitely a cry for attention. If you're on the internet, it's because you need attention. You're bored. You want somebody to talk to you, uh, to, you know, to, to, to put you into, um, you know, to put you into a relaxed state of mind or whatever. That's what this show is for. It's, it's giving you attention in a sense that it is attending to, uh, a, a part of your thoughts that is regularly unaddressed because you cannot communicate these things with most people because most people don't understand these things. Um, so that's why I think of this as a show that maybe people would, you know, consider to be just as core to, like, I don't, I don't know if the type of people who like these videos are that different from the type of people who would like the Otagonzo tapes. Um, that's why I'm wondering, you know, if the Patreon should be for both or just one, because if this show came out with regularity and was like a guaranteed thing. And, you know, like, I wouldn't do it for scraps because scraps would only exist on the basis of me having scraps, you know, um, just likewise that bigger videos or other projects, um, should only exist on the basis of me having completed a big project to release. There should be no expectation of their completion until they are complete and they should be monetized by themselves, you know, um, if at all. So, like, you know, uh, but the, the two things that are, that I consider to be things I want to do and keep up with, uh, you know, would it be better to account for both of them? That's, I guess, a question I have. This is not, no longer answering this guy's question. But, like, uh, yeah, Don Jolly, just by copying his attitude and partially because um, I said this in, in a previous podcast that I had previously been like really fixated on money as the way that I needed to help people like, oh, once I get myself into a financially stable situation, I'll be able to help out my friends more, um, you know, with what, whatever they've got going on. And like, this is a combination of me feeling like I can't ask for help from other people because of the fact that like I'm in a better station from them than them. So like, you know, oh, like like how could i burden them with needing to help me when they are themselves in need of help you know um not really considering the fact that like it's always a give and take like helping others is a way to help yourself this show is me helping myself to understand myself better through communicating with other people and it's working really well you know um because I'm being clear about my intent and therefore people are able to respond to me with nothing veiled. There's no, there's no confusion about the, the conversation we're having, you know, at least for me. So, uh, yeah, I guess being clear about your intentions and, uh, the one, the one piece of advice that I do want to give is just never assume that anybody knows what you are thinking even if it seems obvious even if it's just as simple as like if you think somebody's shirt looks cool make sure you say like hey dude cool shirt because they're not going to assume you think their shirt is cool even if you think they must know their shirt is cool they put on the shirt because it is cool and there are maybe some uppity fucks out there who would be like Ugh. I know the shirt is cool, but if they're like that, you do not want to be friends with those people. Uh, but you know, like most people will appreciate it when you notify them of something they are doing right or even something they're doing wrong. Like if, if you think that somebody would appreciate being notified of, uh, you know, something that they happen to be doing without realizing it politely, uh, you know, be somebody who can, who can both offer critique and uh, appraisal, and you will be respected by your peers. All right, uh, the next question is from Nagen, who says, Nagen, uh, 
One question I have in regards to your transition, how much of this side of yourself did you see watching Evangelion for the first time and second time? And how much of yourself do you see now when thinking about Evangelion? Do you feel like you have more to say about the show following your life experience as a trans person? Do you feel like the show could say something about you as a trans person? I'm sure it could. Um, it's interesting because... So, before... I, I, I don't think I really started to kind of identify the idea that like I specifically wanted to be a girl until probably when I was 16 when I like got into lolly art and stuff and like got into anime aimed at girl or not aimed at girls but anime like aimed at guys but with all girl casts stuff like Hidamari sketch you know like my attraction to shows like that made me start to think that I literally wanted to be female but like I would say that when I was 14, when I saw Ava, which was slightly before that era, uh, my mentality was more uh, that I thought I was bisexual um, because, like, I was having these confusing feelings of, like, you know, feeling a more feminine kind of, like, sexuality that I would project both onto women but also onto characters like Link or like Dante that were like kind of effeminate looking men that I had posters of in my room. And like in retrospect, like I connect with Link heavily because I think like Link, there is like an oddly non-binary quality to Link maybe just because he is effeminate and like literally a fucking fairy boy. But like, um, or maybe because of the, the subtext of Ocarina of Time with him being like a Hylian that was raised as a, uh, Kokiri even. Um, but like the existence of, uh, Linkle, like in my mind was just kind of like proof of something like, oh, of course, of course that would have to exist, you know, like, yeah, of course, uh, Link, Link would have a female form because like Link's already kind of effeminate, you know, like I think. I think that maybe I don't know if the mentality was more that Link would have broader appeal and that he would appeal to like both men and women if he was, you know, more effeminate um, or just like, hey, let's make a girl version for girls. But it certainly speaks to me um, almost as much as Sam is here, because uh, something I'm going to talk about in that anime video I'm going to make um, is that. I've come to recognize that, like, the core of all my instincts and interests, and particularly in anime and characters, is uh, motherly energy. It's, like, my desire to essentially be a mother is, like, the core of my interest in, in, in things. And, and uh, I was talking before about the different types of competitiveness, right? And, like... Um, how what I would consider the way that that women tend to compete to be this like more holistic way and and it I think it's it's really a more impressionistic um, type of thing because like okay so think about think about like uh, being somebody who's a, a hunter right like if if you're trying to like combat um, a tiger like you need to have good instincts and heightened senses in that like you have to make decisions quickly in the moment but you also need to like know tactics you need like specific knowledge that you are accessing at the same time as you are you know um like fighting this thing and it's like a one-on-one -on -one immediate competition right and like or if you're fighting against another person like any type of fight is very in the moment and like even if it's like let's say you know a fighting video game it's like it's 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 my my uh well practiced instincts against yours but the the practice involves like this incredible amount of memorization that like anybody who has done would be able to just like ramble about incessantly forever like you know anybody who has mastered a uh, a video game will will know it in a way that is uh incessant to hear about from somebody else you know or to somebody else i mean so like like that that kind of 
that kind of mastery is like there is a, a holistic sense of like, you know, if you're trying to be the best in the world at this one thing, then, um, you know, I consider that like a more masculine form of competition, even though you are comparing yourself to everyone else in the world. It's only about this one thing. Whereas, again, to me, the, the more feminine sense of competition is like trying to just on the whole be better. And that's why there's a lot of different avenues you could take and, and women kind of play to their strengths. They look at themselves as like, OK, well, you know, I'm hot so I can be the hottest person in the room or and that and like if that's what they value then they might think, well, that's all that really matters because being the hottest will get you the farthest in this world if that's their mentality. Or they might think, I'll be the smartest, uh, you know, person in this, you know, in, in, in town, essentially, in, in whatever the, the sphere of their social influence is, you know, whoever there is for them to compete with. Like, so it is kind of the same as being like, I'll be better than you at this one specific thing. But it's it's more that you have the mentality that because you are better than them at that specific thing, you are therefore better than them in general, you know, uh, because that thing is the most valuable thing to be specifically good at. Maybe a lot of men feel this way as well, but I think it seems to me more like a, a mentality of like, oh, like this is my field. This is what I do. I am a specialist. You know, and that's what I take pride in is that I know this thing the best, you know. Um, but I could be wrong. Maybe I'm putting – like, and again, when I talk about gender, I really want you to think of it as a metaphor because I think that everybody has both of these things inside of them. Like everybody has – whatever what I describe as like masculine or feminine, I only, I only describe them that way because I think of it in terms of majorities. It's like – in terms of who is more likely to exhibit these characteristics, not like who is guaranteed to exhibit these characteristics, you know? So, like, uh, in that sense, like, what I look at as, like, the reason that, um, the reason that the impressionistic side to me reads as more maternal is that, like, in raising a child, like, it, it's about the extreme long-term reward, you know? I mean, like, think about, for instance, like, feminine uh, uh, sexuality versus male. Like, a guy is trying to get a nut. He is working towards one specific uh, goal, um, trying to get to it as quickly as possible because that's the... All he's trying to do is get release. His body is telling him to do this thing, so he does it, right? Now, obviously, there are plenty of men who can enjoy the emotional side of sexual experience, um, but I would consider that to be more commonly a feminine trait. Now, is this only because society teaches men like not to be emotional and like to avoid these types of experiences? Maybe, but I think that there are a lot of people who are perfectly in touch with their emotions, understanding of themselves, but simply feel that like they want to be someone who uh you know like does things and doesn't think too much about their emotions and is you know fulfills a tra what is traditionally considered a masculine role and whether you're a man or a woman you know to me that is like what is masculinity it doesn't matter what you're born as like that is the 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 idea of it as a social construct you know um which has again a lot more meaning than actual sex and sex doesn't determine nearly as much about your personality you know uh so yeah i would i would argue okay i forgot i was talking about fucking evangelion that was the point of this question uh yeah like so because of the fact that i had not identified myself as uh as trans at the time um i connected a lot with the like the fact that Shinji, you know, almost like basically falls in love with Kaoru, um, because he's like so lonely that he can't understand like what he wants. And like for me, like my relationship with I had one relationship with a guy online that lasted about just as long, um, and uh, ended about just as like you know, um, 
in a blaze of glory, I guess. So how the fuck did I even get here and how do I get out? Like, I don't understand where the fuck I ended up. I know people don't like when I get distracted by the video game and this and these things, but uh, I truly lost myself this time. Anyway, um, I'm just going to go to the next question because I'm like... I'm sure I could relate my trans experience to Ava, but it's, um, I feel like maybe I would have an easier time with other shows. Um, okay. I got distracted because I was trying to figure out what the fuck was going on with that map. Moon's Deity asks, uh, says, here to wish you a better future, and I'm looking forward to it. I recall you mentioned a few times that you started writing blogs slash making videos because you were seeking affirmation from others. That sentence stuck with me very much, perhaps because I'm feeling the same way at the current stage of my life. Um, I suppose you've advanced a few steps above that initial goal as an artist already, and I'm seeing this as just another step. I think a lot of factors of your content bit by bit has got me to aspire to become someone like you. Bunch of stuffs you brought up have crosses with my own thought process throughout my lives, fixation on childhood, etc. I suppose a lot of people connected themselves with you because of those reasons. And when they are told you are transitioning, they are met with a huge disconnection because that it wasn't also a part of their past. Hence, they feel betrayed and whatnot. Sounds like I'm the minority, but I did not see it coming because those hints people had been saying seeing sounds to me like they are not integral to your identity at all. I'd always imagined those were just some thought you come across, you decipher it to a semi-conclusion for next time, and then you move on. And so I was also surprised by the news, but I guess you're more than just a figure of aspiration at this point. To me, you present a possibility, so I don't see myself departing from your channel. Though have not been consuming all of your content, but oftentimes I feel like there are a few beats of inconsistencies laying in your narrative which I can't pinpoint. Since the transition, I figure this whole gender thing you've been dealing with might be the cause. Not that I believe one must live consistently with the brands they craft, but now it is out of the way. I'm intrigued to see what shape your content will take. No real questions, really. Just a non-patron fan's proper response to your development. All right. So, yeah. Um... I, I'm really interested in this because, like, I was saying before that uh, a big part of my reason for transitioning is that I feel like my identity on the internet has always been confusing. That, like, people have been, like, they've always seen these, uh, like he said, inconsistencies that, like, never quite added up. And the reason that, like, the stuff that I said about trans stuff would just seem like passing thoughts is because, like, I... I was avoidant, you know, like I avoided like, I think like affirmative information because like, again, when I was a teenager, there was a period where I really strongly believed that like I wanted to be a girl, but because of the fact that I'm also mostly sexually attracted to girls as well, I just like couldn't parse whether it like how much of it was my desire to be a girl versus be with a girl. And like, when I finally did get with a girl, it felt like, well, I enjoyed sex with a girl. So like, okay, you know, I did it. I did it as a guy, you know, like, so this must mean I enjoy sex as a guy. Right. And like, it's funny because, well, I'm not going to get too into the details of my sexual experiences. I'm going to save that for the last question so that, uh, any of me or May's parents who might be listening to this won't have to hear it. But, uh, you know, like, it's just like the the women I've been with like the sexual experiences I've had with them I don't think are what a typical guy would have um, and certainly with both of them I explored like gender play so it's not as though this wasn't on the table or something they understood about me um, and like you know again like the reason that it might seem like it only ever came up in like blips and hints isn't because it wasn't important to me, but because I didn't understand it. And so I did not know how to translate it or put it forward because I didn't know how to express it in a way that like wouldn't just be like cringy or scary. Like there's this one um, Twitter that I follow. I'll put a link to it in the description uh, that I really love their art, um, but it's all like these these really like just frenetically drawn 
uh, probably MS Paint, like, mouse-drawn pictures of cute girls um, that look super adorable, but, like, there's always text next to them that's just, like, I wish I was a girl, I wish I was a girl, I want to die, I want to die, everything's painful, this world is the worst place, of the, it, like, but the, the pictures are always super adorable. And, like, I, uh, you know, I have a very frenetic art style, and there are a lot of art artists who are, you know, like, sort of outsider artists or niche artists or people with weird styles that I am a fan of, that I take inspiration from, but, like, I always felt as though, like, you know, I, like, the amount of frustration I feel that my drawings are not, like, at a technical level that I feel like anybody would appreciate them, um, has kept me from practicing drawing enough to reach that level, even though, like, like, I've now gotten into drawing because I appreciate that even without the technical skill, I am capable of capturing the emotions I'm trying to go for in my illustrations that I always have been. And, like, the few illustrations that I have uh, done that I've held on to over the years, um, you know, the reason I held on to them is not because they are technically good. It's because they meant something and they I needed to draw them in order to understand something about myself. And, like, when I look at them now, you know it's like I feel as though I could recognize what that purpose was, you know? So, like, um, so I want to continue drawing because regardless of doing it as some kind of product where the end result is I get acknowledgement for, you know, drawing a good drawing or whatever, I just want to draw because, like, I need to express certain things through drawings. I cannot understand them in other ways, you know, regardless of the technical uh, skill that, that, is, uh, that I achieve. And, like, it's it's really funny that throughout like my career i've played this character of like being extremely secure with myself even though like something i you know didn't even really understand about myself is that i'm only secure about things that i'm willing to be secure about and i'm totally insecure about other things that i you know just haven't come to terms with and like that's another thing i really think uh you know I don't want to, like, sound like I'm dissing my parents, but it's definitely a carryover from them where, like, my parents very much have a, like, I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks, like, attitude in terms of, like, how they think about the world. But in terms of actually being in public, they are, like, very much about appearances and very easily embarrassed, especially my dad. My dad is very easily embarrassed in a public setting. And I'm not, um, you know, because I think that, people are comforted by you being weird because anybody who wants to be in a more emotionally expressive state uh, is comforted by the fact that somebody is kind of doing it for them. That's what we want famous people for. Like, famous people exist to express something that people are wishing they could express themselves but can't because they're trapped in a shittier situation. And, you're like, I'm somebody who has dealt with a lot of feelings that are mostly felt by people uh, who are in a worse situation to deal with those feelings than I am. And, like, you know, like, I can, like, I guess because of the fact that I have an understanding of the fact that, like, if you... If you, like, think about yourself in terms of the fact that you are a victim, it will not help you in any way because the world at large is not out to protect you. Um, if you want to get by, you have to be able to protect yourself, and that takes a lot of emotional strength because... You know, if you want to learn how to live, you have to connect with other people, and that's really difficult if you don't think that anybody's ever going to accept you, or that you're not going to be able to communicate with them because you don't already have the communication skills. And it's very difficult to find people who are going to be patient with you, and who are going to try to help you develop those skills. 
but you will not find them if you do not try. It always just comes down to no matter how many times you fail, no matter how many times it sucks, you have to keep trying. That's what Evangelion is ultimately about by Hideaki Anno's own description. It's also what Gurren Lagann is about, and it's it's just the only theme that really matters is you have to spiral out, keep going. You just you have to keep trying because you just won't make it if you don't. And you know, people tend to stop their lives when they've they just can't bring themselves to try anymore because they've tried too many times and they they don't think they can do it. And it's like the only thing that's going to keep those people around is if you know, those of us who could help them, who could give them a reason to stick around, are constantly giving them a reason to stick around. Because the fact of the matter is that there are some people who are worthwhile who just need constant affirmation, or at least until they are emotionally healed enough to move on. And, like, I am somebody who needs that. I need a ridiculous amount of attention. I am an absolutely attention-starved person. Because... When I was a little kid, I got tons of attention from my mom and from the TV and from nowhere else. You know, like, uh, not to say that my dad, you know, didn't give me attention at the times that he was around, but he was not around all the time when I was a kid. He was in the Navy, you know, he was on Lee, uh, he was out all the time. And like, uh, I, like, the main things I remember aside from being with my mom is like watching lots of Barney and Sesame Street and stuff like that. And like, those are like like when the only influences on you are caretakers then it's like what is there for you to relate to other than the desire to be yourself a caretaker like i just wanted to be like my mom who you know i was constantly insisted i look exactly like and you know she's the only role model i really have and barney the dinosaur and like you know and, and sesame street it's like I wanted to be like these characters on these shows and uh, ultimately, you know, who, what are these characters? They're people who are trying to like psychologically nourish uh, the, the next generation of, you know, people who are going to be controlling the world. And like in a world that is insanely fucking broken and fractured and fucked up and there's tons of shit you have to keep track of. It's really hard to maintain psychological strength. And, uh, you know, for me, it's like I'm looking at everything and I don't know how to like I have a tendency when I want to talk about something to literally think I have to start by describing the Big Bang. Like I've written tons and tons and tons of things over my life where I've started by describing the Big Bang, because that's the, the the earliest point in causality that we know about. And in order to understand anything, you really need to understand the entire causal chain that led to it. You know, but like most of us have enough sense of that, that you don't literally need to explain the Big Bang every time. But it's like, I just want to put it in people's heads all the time that like every single element of causality ultimately has something to do with anything you're talking about. Um, so, like, how do I get, like, when if, if I'm trying to tell you, like, okay, why do I identify as a woman, right? And I start from causality, or I start from when I was born, it's the road that I'm trying to go down is so fucking long, I'm never going to get there. And that's why this show exists, because rather than me trying to explain literally the whole universe to try to make you understand something i could just ask you what parts you don't understand and then explain those parts you know that's what communication is about and i never learned how to do that growing up so like you know through watching people just patient like somebody like don jolly who will just ask like if you if he doesn't know the piece of information you say he will ask immediately because he wants to know he wants to be smarter he's not insecure about what he doesn't know because he knows that he will be even more secure with himself once he does know the thing he doesn't know that's the the the, the mentality you know and like uh if somebody who he likes is doing something that he appreciates he wants them to know about it and like i have this tendency to just kind of assume that people already know i like their stuff that i don't have to remind them or like that they know i'm in their corner or that they know i have their back or that like 
you know, that like, oh, they're busy, so I don't need to try to talk to them. Like, even if I have an idea, it's just like, uh, you know, it's easier to just like signal out to the whole internet to just like post on Twitter or post on, uh, you know, to make a YouTube video and be like, okay, well, I don't know which of my friends might want to talk about this thing, but surely somebody on the internet does and I could talk to them, you know, but like, I don't get the, 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 the depth that I would get of when I talk to somebody who I know, who knows about me, who's like, you know, experienced, uh, you know, life with me as a person in it. So like, you know, I'm trying to, not only am I trying to reach out to the internet in new and exciting ways, I'm also trying to reach out to my actual friends and, you know, people in my life, which is why, again, I got a lot of shit going on while also being behind on a lot of shit that I have to do. Um, but, you know, I, again, I have a very roundabout, impressionistic, circular way of thinking and doing things. And, um, you know, that, again, I was talking about how, how men favor the, 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 the short-term success, the immediate come. And with women, it's more about the, the waves, the, the, the remaining in the feeling, the, the mood. And, uh, I like to be lost in a mood. I like sex to go on forever and like to just do as much of it as possible for it to last as long as possible. Um, I do not go until I come. I usually come like, I don't know, three to 10 times in a sexual encounter. Um, so like, that's not normal for a guy necessarily. Like, uh, I'm not usually on top necessarily like you know it's like i i think that the the i i relate well to the 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 tides and the moon phases and the seasons and all these kinds of things affect my thinking um you know more so than thinking about immediate tasks and like when i think about a community or i think about a group of friends i think about all of it holistically what can i do that will influence the trajectory of this group that is what i consider to be like maternal matriarchal thinking you know patriarchal thinking is how can i protect the sanctity of this group matriarchal thinking is how can i move the ethos of this group how can i or strengthen the ethos how can i protect the ethos of this group um you know if uh, if it's if if it if its sanctity deserves that that that's that's what i consider so like in my mind i am out to offer psychological guidance and assistance in the effort of leading people towards being better members of their community um because it ultimately benefits me in that people if i can help you you will help me in some way and there are a lot of ways you can help me like you know I started work like as soon as I came out, I, I immediately reached out to uh, several musician friends of mine who I had been wanting to produce albums with that like had, you know, like offered to work with me at times in the past. But I just always had the mentality of like, oh, I don't know when I'll find time to like, you know, do these projects like, oh, once once I've finished all this work I have to do, I'll do these projects and like. I just kind of reached out and was like, hey, let's like, here's an idea, like, let's do this, you know, and like, I've gradually been plucking away at projects with these various people and like, you know, it's, it's extremely satisfying and I, I get to explore, you know, a type of thing I had never done before. And it's not like I'm necessarily saying, hey, everybody message me right now with all, all your beats because I will be overwhelmed, and not be able to do anything, uh, you know. I'll let you know when that time comes, but like, I want to know who those people are because like the reason I don't use people's stuff when they send it to me is that I just like, I don't know how far I want to go into, you know, the relationship with, with this person. I guess really the problem I have is that I always assume everybody I talk to, I am going to become friends with and I'm going to want to exhaust the implications of what I can do with this person. Again, overscoping. I overscope every interaction I have. And so I become afraid of the interaction because, you know, 
I'm afraid of like how quickly it's going to spiral out of control and become like a def a more defining part of my life than I expected, or just something that you know becomes more involved than initially intended. Um, so like, you know, I I guess I guess I'm trying to mitigate that. I feel like I uh, I wrote down here trial of the unknown tape. Um, yeah. Oh, I was I was going to talk about. Uh, so there's uh, a, a YouTube channel called Dot Smite, um, run by a girl called Carla, who is in my Discord, who wrote a whole book analyzing all my albums called Trial of the Unknown Tape. And this book really fascinated me because uh, I read it all just in one go, and it's sort of a stream of consciousness diatribe written over the course of months with uh with like re-edits as she went back and like updated opinions on things or rethought through things and stuff like that and didn't want to have to like you know try to make this whole book cohesive in the end um but like the book is about like essentially like trying to emotionally parse why she feels so connected to this music and um it was really interesting to me because, like, reading the book, I felt like it was always, like, right on the verge. Like, like everything it was saying was accurate, but, like, there's – I guess the, the problem is that all of my lyrics have, like, four or five meanings that you – like, four or five lenses you could look at them through that, you know, people tend to connect to one or two but not look at the metaphor for how it could – how it could be looked at a second or third way because i have a tendency to represent external con or internal conflict as external conflict and vice versa where i might you know describe something that sounds like a battle within myself when i'm actually talking about my relationship to somebody else or you know or the inverse of that uh more likely the inverse um like framing my own inner personal conflict as as two like a conflict between two people you know um or just relating myself to like the rest of the world in some kind of broad sense but like the unknown tape is the one album that is like the most abrasive and the most uh uh it doesn't have any lyrics with it and that's because I did not want to give any additional definition to any of it beyond what was apparent on the surface because it was extremely vulnerable and a lot of it was written from like a, a feminine perspective that like I did not want to reduce because I'm very protective of my feminine side and like if you listen to some of the songs um so, like a lot of them are, are sort of conversations between like my male and female half or like n trying to navigate my or or like again like representing outer relationships as inner ones and stuff like that there's just lots of there's lots of stuff that like i didn't know how to explain it because if i started saying things like oh I feel like I have like a bifurcated fucking dissociated identity. People are going to be like, you need to go see a fucking therapist. And it's like, well, I've already seen a therapist. Like I, I get, I get what's going on. I just don't know how to explain it in a way where it will sound like I get what's going on. Like, it sounds like I have a handle on this and like, it's not, you know, some scary shit that needs to get a diagnosis because the fact of the matter is that the diagnoses that exist for like you know examining people's minds are extremely limited like they're very broad like the term autism you know uh the reason it's considered a spectrum is because like it's a it's a broadly encompassing term for a bunch of things that we don't have better more specific terms for necessarily yet because we don't really completely understand it yet you know um but if you can come up with your own terms by which to understand the world um, that, you know, allow you to navigate it successfully, then that is good enough, you know, for uh, for making it in the world. And so, like, you know, 
I'm not as interested in learning all of the specific terms so that I can, you know, get the closest diagnosis to what science has yet discovered. I'd rather try to understand myself emotionally um, and then, like, you know, find the words that allow me to express that to other people in a way that they'll understand regardless of whether it is, like, scientifically, you know, well-defined. Um, but, like, so the Trial of the Unknown Tape is, like, these extremely vulnerable and, and, and troubled emotions from various periods because, like, you know, it sort of began during, uh, I guess, a period where I felt the most in touch with my emotions that I had felt in a very long time. Like, if you listen, I mean, Gay and Dead is an album about being out of touch with my emotions, but half of it was written after I had gotten with May. And so there's like this kind of ironic tone where like I already know that I've gotten out of this. Like I already know I've started to reconnect with my emotions on some of the tracks. So like the album doesn't come off as like depressing as if you, you know, just listen to like the first few songs that got recorded, like Fall Into Pieces or Paradise or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the first track, Broken Brilliance. Like... The album kind of gets goofier as it goes along because more of it was written later. Body Rolls is also dark as shit. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, like, the albums I did after that, like, uh, go down a road of, like, exploring, like, you know, manic high, manic low, where, like, simultaneously I'm feeling the happiest I ever have because I'm with this person, but I'm also still dealing with, like, all these unresolved you know, emotions that I have to face on the internet. Um, and the unknown tape was like, just like, I'm getting to a point where I am the, mo like, because I am dealing with emotions that are so deeply personal in my personal life. Um, like I cannot even express myself effectively on the internet because like, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't feel as though I was in it. I didn't feel as though the environment surrounding me was one in which I could be, I, I could switch gears and go in an emotional direction and, uh, and explain myself well and not just like get ruthlessly shit on, you know? Um, and like, I think I was overly afraid, but like what allowed me to finally like, uh, Stop being so afraid partially was May's live stream that I talked about the corrupting your kids stream because she was talking to a lot of people who like had been fans of mine who I'd like known about and seen their name for a long time but never like talked to because I just didn't really like you know I didn't know what they would be like as people and I'm always afraid that like you know I've met or I've talked to fans who were fucking strange and I've had weird you know relationships so I try to stay away but like when I realized that they were cool people who, like, I would have gotten something out of talking to, then it made me kind of, like, regret that, you know, some of these people have been in my audience for six fucking years. I've known they were there this whole time, and I could have been friends with them, but I just was never willing to put myself out there because I thought, you know, I didn't want to risk what would happen. And granted, some of these people have probably grown a lot, and maybe it's better that I'm meeting them now, with, you know, at a, at a time when... We, we've all grown and we're all better ready to deal with each other. But, like, still, you know, Carla was one of the callers into the show on the first episode. And I had, you know, I had known her as a commenter from a, a time when she was not identifying as female on the Internet, at least yet. Um, so, like, I had no idea that she had transitioned. And when... I realized that she was trans. I was like, oh, well, that's why you connect with my music. Like, and the, the book had never really addressed this. Like, I don't know. I don't remember if it like maybe, you know, brought up the suggestion that like, oh, Digi, you know, has said something about dealing with trans issues. But like, it was just a kind of feeling of like, well, if you, if you are a trans woman and you relate to my music this strongly, then like, that is why. Like, because it's, it's a, it's about this, you know, but like, that's never been stated anywhere except for in these heavily coded metaphors on places like the unknown tape, 
where I refuse to post the lyrics, you know, um, or places like uh, um, the 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 following album, the the running one. Anyway, I don't mean to make this about me fucking talking about my music and bragging about how subtle my fucking lyrics are for the 80th time. Um, it's just, you know, uh, like, it's just fascinating to think that, like, that whole book was dedicated to, like, why don't I understand my connection to this album? And it's like, all it would have taken is me just being like yeah like think about it as just like an emotional reflection of the experience of you know living the way that you've been living and it's like okay well now i get it you know um anyway let's go to the next comment jalay lane cassis says first off i think this is closest to my ideal version of your content i was wondering what do you think about the potential of transness especially trans feminine as a byproduct of lack of male archetypes that are worth emulating read the nut checking forms and specifically male fragility and defending the idea of manhood is almost the most important thing about being a man like i'm not really sure where i was going with this you clearly don't have a lack of real role male role model necessarily but i feel like there is a general underswell of negative outlook on maleness in general I don't know if being trans is the best solution to this because it's just abandoning the potential good in masculinity, but honestly, beyond like Kamina or Soul that J, I don't even know what positive masculinity looks like. Well, I mean, I, I would actually say that part of the idea of Kamina's character is to show that he is uh, toxic mass. Like he has positive masculine traits, but also like what what kills him is his, you know, his overly macho um approach that lacks any self-preservation and like that's what nia recognizes is like hey the most the first most important thing is that you live to fight another day you know um and like that's what she like imparts uh into simon that that you know causes him to balance that you know his his masculinity and the macho influence with the you know the patience and care that uh that nia teaches him to appreciate you know so like uh simon is to me a very great male role model because he is uh you know somebody who's well balanced but um uh as i said before you know like i i consider like the 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 masculine ideal is sort of that you get things done you know that like that you take charge you you make the 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 decision to like stop stop thinking about the possibilities and do the thing and not to say that women can't get things done too I, again as i said you know these are all metaphors but like uh you know like the the desire to continually remain in a state of like patrolling the possibilities and emotions you know i see as more of a uh, a a you know again a social building like uh, you're more concerned about maintaining the structure of the society around you you know and like this can manifest in a lot of very toxic ways as well there's uh, there's certainly toxic femininity is something that i think uh, deserves as much of a firm description as toxic masculinity so that more people could uh could understand it and maybe i'll give a better sense of that again also in my uh in my video about um, how I relate to anime characters, but like, you know, it, it, essentially the the two sides of of the cyn like the cynical way that you can look at social, um, you know, caring about things in a social sense is that it's manipulative. That you're literally trying to make the people around you act the way that you want them to act, and like, what you have to learn how to do if you are somebody who like thinks this way is to you know like work with people again like to figure out what their intentions are and help them to best realize their own intentions not your intentions you know um and if there's somebody who cannot be helped or does not want to be helped in the way that you can offer it then it's just not your responsibility to work with that person you know um anyway uh so like yeah like uh, i would say that like I considered my I consider my dad to be a positive role model and that he is somebody who, you know, always busted his ass and like his his coda is just like, you know, you just I you have to just do it. Uh 
Casey Neistat is another person who I kind of looked at as a male role model in my life who literally has like work harder tattooed on his body. And like, again, I don't know if that's necessarily healthy masculinity either that he's like so obsessive about like, you know, so hard on himself to like constantly be in a state of doing something. But like, I think that kind of restlessness, that kind of feeling of like, all right, being emotional is is uh you know too slow it's 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 uh, it doesn't it doesn't advance things i need to be out there doing things but like i look at casey neistat and i see how slow his evolution is like his style has been the exact same because he's not spending time thinking about where to take things he's spending time thinking about what to do and that is fine insofar as it is able to provide for his family successfully it is able to give him an outlet for expression and he keeps himself doing things but i just don't think that you know i get tired of watching his videos because they don't evolve enough it's been kind of the same thing for a long time and i don't know if he can continue to to inspire people if you know if like his tricks become old hat or if like people don't think that he's evolving in his own perspective because he's not taking the time to do that instead of constantly stay on the grind you know um not to say that i think casey's like a thousand percent washed up but he is at least like 60 to 80 percent washed up you know is what i'm trying to say um all right i think i've answered this question and also what the fuck am I looking for in this goddamn room? There's, like, one more thing I have to scan. I don't know where the fuck it is. I don't know if it's on one of these pillars. I This room is a pain in the fucking ass every time I play this goddamn game. I know it's just going to be something that I'm going to feel fucking foolish for having missed. It's probably, like, on a platform. As soon as I find it, I'll read the next question. You're just going to have to sit with me. I know you don't want to, but that's just the, those, those are the breaks. I fucking can't find it. All right, we're reading the next question. Xenospace says, what attracted you to anime as a medium more than other mediums? Using your skills in analysis, you probably could have succeeded in analyzing other mediums such as movies, not a fan, Western cartoons, comics, or live action television, yet you've chosen to plainly focus on anime. Why is that? What about anime appeals to you more? Please answer my question within the next two podcasts. I've been thinking about this. So, why was I a repressor for so long? Why was I afraid to come out? Because I am afraid of the world. I am generally a fraidy cat. I am afraid of emotional experiences because I'm afraid of being hurt by them because I was not challenged by emotional experiences very often early in life and I ran away from the challenges that I was eventually presented with as I did not know how to deal with them. And only later in life have I learned how to deal with emotional experiences. But, uh, you know, that is a result not of lacking the ability to understand things emotionally. But in fact, feeling so intense when I do feel emotions uh, that it is, like, paralyzing. And thus, like, you know, I'm trying, like, like... I feel as though – this is, like, how I kind of relate to Shinji. Uh, like, somebody asked me on Twitter, I think, like, uh, isn't Shinji emotionally retarded? And it's like, well, Shinji's not inherently emotionally retarded. He just second guesses everything that everyone around him is doing because he can imagine so many different possibilities of what those emotions could be. And he doesn't know how to comfortably confront people to find out what they are actually thinking. And so, like – You know, emotional intelligence is, like, something that you develop through experience, but, like, there are people who have the literal ability to understand emotions better or worse, and I think the better you can understand them, the more harrowing it is because you feel other people's pain so fucking intensely and also the pain that they inflict on you, you know? So, like, um... The reason that I think that I favor anime is that Japan is a, in my mind, a culture of repression. Japan is a culture that is where they believe that, you know, the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Uh, you are, you are meant to fit, stick in line, stay in line with society. But this isn't to say that they don't acknowledge emotion. They are just 
very capable of, you know, of saying like, oh, I have an emotional life and I have like a social life, you know, as a member of society. And like you can have a social emotional life somewhere like the Internet, which is kind of what otakuness is all about. But like, again, these things are very separated. Your otaku life is 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 a is a different entity. Like if you ever watch otaku no video, you know, like this this running gag where they're interviewing these otaku like at their jobs and stuff. And even though each of them has like a literally hidden identity with like a voice morpher and like a thing hiding their face, several of them still like won't even admit to their otaku hobbies. Like they're so ashamed, you know? So like I think that this leads to anime being extremely reserved. Like you don't see there's a lot of anime where like you'll see two characters like run up to each other and just kind of stand there as opposed to touching or hugging or showing any physical affection because like again in Japan like it's seen as like you don't just touch people you know like we're not that physically intimate whereas in America is an extremely emotional forwardly emotional uh, culture and like movies are inherently very forwardly emotional experiences because you are looking at real people often in close up the emotions are being pressed into your face and in anime the emotions are simplified down to a point where there's only a few of them on screen they're very exaggerated and easy to read and like uh, uh, you know it just feels like it is made for people who are not you know ready to face the emotions of something beyond a cartoon, you know, people in Arrested Development, and uh, I guess that's how I would describe myself. Now, I do love movies, but again, they are such intense emotional experiences for me that, like, I really have to be, like, in a certain, like, I have to be, like, ready to experience a movie, and if a movie is going to make me feel a lot, then I don't, like, you know... Like, I don't enjoy getting trapped in my fucking feelings for a week, you know? Uh, so, I would like to get more used to it. And, like, obviously, the more you allow yourself to experience these things, the more you kind of get used to it and desensitize and can handle it more in the future. So, I have been trying to, you know, uh, to let myself be more open to, you know, those kinds of things. But, like, anime is just a medium where... There's a lot of comfort for me. And sure, I might prefer anime that are more emotionally expressive because I am so comfortable and used to the medium. And uh, I understand its communication style so well. Um, but like when I go into other mediums, it's kind of like it's easier for me to ex appreciate the really experimental and out there stuff that is really trying to convey a very specific emotion than it is for me to enjoy something that's like only got a few unique elements and mostly it's just kind of like by the numbers because I don't like inherently enjoy like just playing any old like decent video game or like reading any old decent book or watching any old decent TV show or movie like I only kind of care about the ones that are spectacularly good whereas with anime I'm so into the meta context that I will watch stuff that is dog shit just to like understand its place in the medium so you know that's another big part of it so, uh, yeah, I would say that pretty much answers that question. Um, I also wrote down the word reclamation there. I think I wanted to maybe bring up the fact that, like, you know, anime also obviously has lots of, like, LGBT undercurrents and, like, I got anim into anime first from a metatextual sense as, like, this medium where I could learn all this stuff about it, and there was, like, cool fights and shit. But the first characters I really connected with would be, like, Inuyasha, Haku from Naruto, um, Naruto himself from Naruto, like, these small, outcast, feminine boys, uh, who were angry at, you know, in the case of Naruto and Inuyasha... Those were, like, the ways I actually projected myself. But Haku was, like, how I actually felt inside. Like, if I were to project the way I really felt, I would have acted like him. And I think that's closer to how I am kind of presenting myself now. Um, but, yeah. So, like, the, just the fact that, you know, anime consistently has characters I can relate to because it's created by people who are in a similar mindset to me, um, you know... Not to say that there aren't movies like that as well, but again, movies tend to be less emotionally reserved. And, like, I think both Japan and uh, England 
are are both cultures I've always related to like more easily than a lot of American stuff, especially in their humor, specifically because of the fact that it acknowledges that like you know that bifurcation of like oh you know we have to say these things to fit into polite society but also how i really feel is kind of like slipped in there as well and uh americans are just so much more direct in a way that um you know i'm good at imitating because like i learned my communication from americans ultimately but like actually being direct myself has always been a challenge uh, anyway, Mildew on Rice says, Just want to say this has been my favorite series you've created so far. Like a lot of your audience, I was originally drawn in by the long-form anime analysis content, but stayed for series like this. I definitely feel as though I heavily relate to the way you think, especially the way you jump from point to point, how you take a question and run it in so many different directions that it becomes hard to place where you originally began. I find this aspect of my thinking punishing in conversation, though, where I'll have a point in my mind, but by the time it's my turn to speak, I've already leapt to something new and find myself stumbling with a ton of ums and uhs, looking for the origin of my new thought. This is especially exacerbated for me in social situations involving strangers or acquaintances, which contributed to my development of social anxiety at an early age. That and instances of misunderstanding me of my uh, of me by my peers. You describing your early life as rejecting the notion that your differences are not okay and finding the world weird for not understanding. For me, I largely had the opposite reaction and became self-blaming. And I still find it difficult to remember that a lot of the insecurities I have are those shared by others, even now in my late teens. Listening to this podcast, I've been thinking about how gender relates to that. I'm cis female, but always felt the most criticized among my female peers, mainly because I felt interactions between girls in a group were too complex, and there wasn't room for any kind of social misstep or awkwardness. Despite the distress I felt in childhood, it was never noticed, as far as I know, by my teachers or peers, that I was socially anxious, and I think now that the accepting of passivity or shyness as traits in girls contributed to this. So I was wondering, if you experienced feelings like this as a kid, what... What is it? What it was like to navigate anxiety while being raised assigned male, and if that influenced expectations of managing your fears, or if you didn't, how does someone who lacks assertiveness due to a past like this begin to start expressing their interests and thoughts openly again without fear of social repercussions? Greatly enjoying the positivity of this podcast, and I'm excited to see more of it. Okay, so I've only really learned how to do this recently. Like, the fact that I'm doing this podcast series is like a result of me getting good at this, so... I'm here to help, but, um, you know, I think that you're probably right that the idea that girls are passive is why, um, nobody raised this issue to you. But however, as a guy, I mean, like, I was like just tormented for being passive. Like the fact that I was recognized for the fact that I would not do anything, I mean, Honestly, I think that the reason I wasn't bullied a lot worse than I was is that people couldn't get a reaction out of me. Like, I would just kind of look at you glossy-eyed and be like, why? You know, like, why are you doing this to me? Like, why are you bullying me? I don't understand. Like, for most of my growing up. And then, like, when I was a teenager, I think that people were just afraid that I was, like, an actual school shooter. But I got more shit from, like, my, my friends or the people who I hung around because of the fact that, like, I was obnoxious and abrasive, you know, and insistently so. And it didn't, it, like, even though I, I hated that people made fun of me, I thought I, like, deserved it because, like, I didn't know how to not be cringy, you know? And so, like, that kind of self-hate caused me to just, like, not really care and, like, not adjust my behavior to, you know... Uh, to be l less hated by those people because, like, again, I was still was kind of blaming them. It's kind of like, oh, well, you accept me first and then I'll be less of a dick, you know? And I think that's just kind of been my mentality my whole life until I got well, – not even until I got with May, but basically until um, until I kind of experienced ego death partially through getting really into smoking weed and just kind of like distancing myself from the need to like i don't know have that kind of like emotional acknowledgement from other people and like finding more emotional acknowledgement within myself and 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 also getting it from may and not feeling like i need everybody 
in the like at, like you know, feeling like she was giving me enough acceptance that I didn't need it from like a ton of other people, uh, certainly not strangers on the internet, you know. Um, so like that helped me to some extent to to not like feel as though like I need to constantly be mad at people for not like validating me for the things that I felt like I had done. Um, but like in terms of then attempting to like connect with people over things like other than you know my own accomplishments or like talking about my own interests it's like i guess it's like a matter of figuring out who i am interested in and then like what they can tell me like like you know i love doing these podcasts right where i bring people over to my house and like uh for instance the butthole weeb one right like I know Butthole Weeb loves Gosick. I know he wants me to watch Gosick because he wants to know what kind of things I will, like, think about this show that he cares about. So, like, he was coming over to our house to hang out, and I was like, let's just watch Gosick and do a podcast about it. Because, like, that is the most I could engage with something that, like, is a, you know, a, an interest to both of us, and I know we will both get something out of this interaction. There's no chance we won't, you know? So, like, establishing that kind of thing, like, figuring out, okay, like, well, what will me and this person want to do? Like, you know, it, uh, last time my brother Shade came over, we played Guitar Hero. I enjoy Guitar Hero. I know he likes Guitar Hero. This is something that, you know, I will not find time to do on my own, but if Shade's here, let's play Guitar Hero, you know? It's like, um... So like, uh, that's that's kind of like, I, I feel like I'm off topic from what the the question was. How does someone who lacks assertiveness due to passive to begin to start expressing their interests and thoughts openly again? Yeah. So it's like, it's one part like asking yourself, how can I, how do I communicate with this person in a way where I know that they are going to get something out of it, or that I'm going to get something out of it? Like I used to think of it more in terms of like what am I going to get? Now I think of it more in terms of like, well, what can I give you? You know, like if I think of, if, if I hear a song and I think, oh, this guy would like this song, I should send that song to that guy, um, you know, post haste because maybe he will like it. Maybe he'll get something out of it. You know, uh, maybe he'll just appreciate the fact that somebody thought about him at all. Um, it's worth attempting. So like, that's one part. And then, when it comes to like the fear of making mistakes in social situations, which was very paralyzing for me for a long time, uh, because I made a lot of mistakes and I dwelled on all of them. Um, like I would say that like the key is to realize that you can always recover from a mistake. Like if you fuck something up, it's just a matter of making things right. And if somebody won't let you make things right, that is a result of their insecurity and you cannot blame yourself if you are truly, like, if you are truly, you know, trying. And, like, maybe you're not capable of trying hard enough for this person or, like, maybe you just cannot communicate with them in a way that they can, like, feel your intent or maybe your intent cannot help them. And, like, all those things are fine. Those aren't things you can blame yourself for. But just, like... You, you have to approach it like, okay, I'm trying my best, uh, and if I fuck up, uh, then, you know, I can apologize and I can try again. And if, like, people make fun of me for fucking up, then I just need to, first of all, like, consider, like, why are they making fun of me for fucking up? Like, what motivation could they have for making fun of me? And, like, is there any good reason they would have? Or... You know, like, I mean, the answer is no. There's there's no good reason. But, like, there is a reason. And if you can understand that reason and if you think it's forgivable, like, if you think, okay, like, I understand you're just, like, having a bad time and you, you know, need somebody to take it out on. But, like, please don't make me that person, you know? Like, but you don't want to, like, raise this so you don't want to, like, accuse somebody. It's just, like, avoid people who are doing that to you. Don't take it as like, oh, I can't communicate with people because like every time, uh, you know, I try, it ends up like this. It's like there are some people who are in a good mood and are willing to talk and you have to find those people. And like if if there's people who like every time you try, you feel like you're getting accused of something or you feel like you're getting criticized for something or you just feel like, you know, 
um, like they they want conversation to be difficult. Like they want it to be harder for you to connect to them. Those are, you know, those are toxic behaviors. That doesn't make them bad people per se, but like, you know, if you can find someone to communicate with who doesn't behave that way toward you, um, it will be better practice. You know, there's this great scene in uh, in San Gatsu no Lion where uh, this one girl who's uh, friends with one of the main characters, she gets bullied and she, uh, to such an extent that she leaves she leaves school and her family brings her out to this countryside place where they sort of like rehabilitate, um, you know, people to the experience of like fitting into society and they they have a three-step program of first you be you learn to befriend animals then you learn to befriend old people then you move on to kids your own age and it was really interesting to me because like yeah animals uh to to quote um a song by jane's addiction uh, if you want to have a friend feed any animal it's just that simple animals are naive they trust uh, people who have who approach them with kind intentions and do something to benefit them. Um, you know, they 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 have simple minds. They do not harbor the kind of uh, you know. I mean, some of them can. Like some animals are more troubled than others, but like a, a, the common animal will be your friend with little effort. So like. That's one way, you know, and then like old people tend to be more understanding. I mean, this might not work as well if like, say, you're rocking some uh, really weird identity. But like if you could find an old person who is OK with that, you know, maybe that's somebody who you can connect with. Just like anybody who, you know, has enough perspective to not judge you, um, you know, in the same way that uh that younger people would you know like because they they are more understanding of like what you are going through because they've been through a lot of shit and they've had time to self-reflect you know um assuming you have the right old people like you know maybe the old folks in your life are not the best to talk to but you could track down you know old folks are generally lonely they are generally looking for some kind of companionship uh where they can get it so if you can find a way to brighten an old person's day and give them somebody to talk to, uh, you know, like they don't get a lot of it because most young people think they are boring and old and gross and ugly. And it's like, well, that makes them outcasts. So, you know, uh, even if like, it also helps like, if you're somebody who, you know, is easily offended when people are wrong about you, like, for me, you know, it wasn't it wasn't like suffering for me to be in the closet and it is for a lot of people because they I think, you know, a lot of people are not so emotionally repressed just because they are not out. A lot of them want to be out and that is the struggle is that they are they're feeling these intense feelings of wanting to be out and like having to suppress it is really difficult. For me, like, I was successful after a certain point. I mean, I was fucking just a miserable, depressed sack of shit from ages 14 to 20 who accomplished nothing. But, like, when I finally did start, uh, you know, accomplishing things, then, like, running away into a male identity was not difficult or complicated. Like, it was emotionally difficult, um, but not to such an extent where I was like trying to kill myself every day, you know, which is how it is for a lot of people. Um, because I, you know, even if people weren't acknowledging my identity to the extent that I wanted them to, cause I wanted somebody to just like solve it for me and tell me exactly what it is, you know, um, without me having to explain it any further than the unknown tape, you know? Uh, but like, in spite of that, like, it, it was not like torturous day in and day out and especially not after getting with may you know uh, i felt like i was able to explore it in a healthy way and take my time and get to where i am now so like uh you know just like having that space is important but like 
I think that if you are if you are somebody who is like me, who is capable of dealing with like living as the you know the the thing you're not, um, but you're not in this case anyways. You already said you were a cis woman, but like you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you don't mind people being judgmental, that helps. Like old people will let you hang out with them because they are bored even if they are judgmental of you you don't have to be judgmental of somebody just because they are judgmental of you you can choose to just blame the fact that they are old and socially from another era and you can blame the era instead of blaming them and choose to find what is good about them and just appreciate that quality if it exists and uh you know uh, as long as you know it's not so as long as they are not so off put by you that they literally will not communicate with you which you know obviously in that case then whatever fuck them but yeah uh anyway that's enough for that question draco's fire 14 says i guess my question for this would be how did you overcome your trust issues i keep getting told to just go for it but like no people have certainly had it worse than me but my life experience is that people are mostly untrustworthy boring and or actively malicious that paired with self-loathing means interacting with basically anyone is exhausting at best and fucking terrifying most of the time overall just anxiety inducing that's why i don't use social media as i said i don't use twitter nor do i use reddit snapchat insta whatever people use i don't even know I only use Facebook for memes and Messenger to talk to my only two friends. I have a Discord, but only because one of the two uses it to talk to me for whatever reason. So, what convinced you that people are worth the effort? How long did that take for you? It's conflicted, too, because some days I really like people and enjoy conversations, especially ones where I get to ask a lot of questions. When I've had friends, I was also a touchy kind of guy. I like hugs, and I'm not opposed to cuddling in a platonic way. So I guess I want to be a people person, but I just don't trust people to let me. I'm just incredibly tired in general. So on a similar note, how do you motivate yourself to do anything? What convinces you that life is inherently worth living if that is indeed something you feel? That it's worth all the effort and pain? Because the dearth of positives in my life makes me that impossible for me to answer. I've been hospitalized, put on suicide watch, but on a year from that, and life is no easier and no more valuable to me. I'm Sylvester, by the way. If you do respond to this, please use that. Or Julian, I'm undecided on which I prefer. I should change my YouTube name, but I haven't tried. Ramble over. Feel free to ignore me. Well... Uh, sorry for using the YouTube name at the start, I guess. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, for me, it's it's always been a difficult push and pull because ultimately it just comes down to, like, am I getting a satisfying amount of the attention I crave? Like, am, am I feeling like I, like, everyday life is not miserable for me and that has not always been the case like um i think that when i was a teenager like it was really difficult for me to kill myself because of like the guilt i felt over the fact that like my family really cared about me and i was not signaling to them like the fact that i needed help you know like i knew that I had not really been giving my all to trying to make life good and I felt guilty about that because like it's like I know that there's still a chance that there's something worthwhile um I'm just like giving up because it's like it's painful but like I know there are people who would help me if I reached out to them it's just like I'm afraid to reach out to them you know and it sounds like you're in a similar position where like you do want to be in contact with people you're just like i don't know how to trust people and like for me it's like okay so there's there's this idea in um in buddhism about uh there's like a parable about a blind priest right because like it, uh, a buddhist monk is not supposed to cause any harm to anybody at all with their existence like ideally they uh you know they never damage any insect life or anything they don't step on anything they watch where they walk you know they try to minimize their impact on the world to the first extent that this is doable but there's this parable about a blind monk who um you know uh accidentally kills some insects that uh that are in the path that uh that you know like that he had been assured wouldn't have had them or something like that you know like, there's no reason he would have known that he was accidentally causing this pain and like the question is like would would he still be favored in reincarnation and like ultimately 
the idea is that his intent is what matters. That, like, he is trying not to kill anything. He cannot help that which he does not understand he is doing, you know? But, like, I think that whether or not you really believe that about people, that is the way that you should choose to view humanity. It's just, like... You judge them by whether they are acting in good faith or bad faith, and also by whether they are or are not lazy. So what I mean is a bad faith actor is somebody who is, you know, who doesn't really care about um, educating you or like be or coming to an agreement or ending up, uh, you know, with a compromise. They just want you to come to their side. They are trying to, you know, they're trying to make arguments that will lead to people believing them and lead to you, you know, uh, uh, thinking like, oh, like, yeah, this is the, this is the right mode of thought. Um, and it's, it's not always easy to identify those people, but like, there's a lot of people who will, will be arguing in bad faith, uh, you know, in one moment. Or who will, you know, be saying some ignorant shit or who will be manipulating you or who will be trying to get one over on you in that moment. But, like, people cannot help that. People are not intentionally going out of their way to, like, maliciously, you know, manipulate and fuck with people all the time. Some people are. You need to stay away from those people. Uh, but, like, you know, most people are doing it kind of incidentally or in the background, or as a matter of just, like, you know, habits, or of course, and, like, again, if somebody is, like, overly like this, and, and, like, not willing to listen to reason or criticism, or, like, you know, um, you think it's, like, just a drain on your life, then you shouldn't stick around them, but, like, if you are capable of putting yourself in the mindset that, like, this person is sincerely trying to help me, they're just not good at it. I think that describes most people. I think even people who insult you a lot of the time or people who, you know, who like, who are, are like trying to give you unwarranted advice, like even if they're wrong, even if you know they're wrong, if, if they're not like hurting you, it, then you can at least appreciate like, they're intending to try to help you, and you could try to work with them. You could try to bridge this gap of understanding, because if that is their intention, then it's possible that you can bring them to understand you, because, like, they have an interest in you. They have an interest in bringing you to the light, and so you should take a similar interest in them to whatever extent is, is healthy for yourself, I guess, you know? Uh... I, as I said in the previous answers, like, these are things I've struggled with. Um, like I said before, like, I've put myself out there in such a way where, like, I trust my viewers more than most people because they know most things about me. And, like, they've continued to listen or they've continued to appreciate me. So, like, if you leave a comment where you're like, hey, man, super relate to your experiences, really look up to you as a person, uh, want to, you know, hang out someday, then I'm like, okay, well, like, this is somebody who knows a ton of shit about me and they still feel this way. So, like, you know, th they clearly trust me on some level. And so I'm going to trust them, you know, in as far as uh, I know they have my interests at heart, you know? Um and whether they are doing a good or bad job of giving me advice, whether they really understand my interests and are capable of helping me with those things, as long as I know that they have my best interests at heart, I trust them to some extent, you know? Um, this is a big old boss, so I'm going to read the next question before I start the fight. From Perry Lay, or Lee. In a previous video, you mentioned that you stick up for your friends because they're the ones you've connected with the most. Recently, I witnessed a group of my friends fall out with another group of friends in a public discord. One question from this I can't seem to resolve is, what does it mean to stick up for your friends, and does making public statements defending them count as doing so? Another question that's related to the first is how to judge a person's moral character. 
I have a set of moral guidelines for myself that I follow, but I know that others have different moral guidelines. How do I reconcile these differences? Do I judge them based upon my own set of moral guidelines, use their own judgment, uh, judge them, or an amalgamation of the two? Is it a case-by-case -case basis? Okay, so I mean, this is like the difficulty of all fucking friendship is like navigating this space of like, uh, you know, how like, how much give and take does there need to be between you um, on, like, things you disagree about, right? Like, I think that if two people disagree about something and they are – like, it, it doesn't affect one another to have that disagreement, then it shouldn't really matter at all. You should just be able to talk it out and, you know, uh, continue to work together – as long as, you know, it's not destabilizing your relationship because neither of you can shut the fuck up arguing about this this thing, you know? Um, but, like, in which case, it, you know, maybe it's even endemic of something else about your relationship beyond merely the... Uh... So, like, essentially what I consider sticking up for your friends to be is considering their emotions to be your, your, your priority over being correct... Like, if you can't preserve the emotions of those people, then they're going to see it as like, okay, well, you care less about my feelings than you do about being right in this situation. Now, obviously, in most situations where two people disagree, both of their feelings are hurt. And both of them feel like the other person needs to do something in order to, you know, to make them feel better. So, like... The first priority is figuring out, like, what are each of you upset about and what would have to be done to make you not upset anymore. And then there can be negotiation because if, you know, if one person's demands are more than the other person can meet, then they might say, okay, well, like, I'm not going to do that, but what if I did this? You know, you're sort of bartering forgiveness. And that's really what it comes down to is, like, how much are we willing to trade emotionally to uh, to make sure that we reach a place where we're comfortable with one another again? You know, and it could be that that the the loss of comfort is so great that it could never be fully reestablished. But I think that in most cases, uh, you know, in most cases, if you can resolve the discomfort in a way where where both parties feel as though you know. They've been understood, their emotions have been accounted for, they're not being ignored or left behind, then, uh, you know, they will ultimately come out feeling like they can forgive and forget and move along. As for, uh, um, how do you judge somebody's moral character? I would say it, it, it really is a matter of how willing they are to sort of, um, how willing they are to put uh, – to, to, to make those kinds of compromises. Like if somebody's mentality is like it's always about what I get out of something and like I only – I'm only thinking about my interactions in terms of like my, the benefit that I get, um, then it's like that person is never going to have your best interest in mind. And like even if they claim – that they do, but like they, their actions do not reflect it. Um, and you know, like, or they, they, they don't recognize it when they're called out or they, you know, just like will not consider your emotions or, you know, like cons they like for whatever reason, whatever justification they have, if they won't consider your emotions, then they're not worth communicating with. It's just like, if you won't, like even if you're if even if you think that like my emotions are unjustified if you're not willing to attempt to you know to reach something that we can both be happy with then it's the communication is not worth continuing anyways i'm probably going to uh take a break now and then record the rest of this insanely what is going to be a ridiculously long episode in a second part cuz it's fucking what time is it? It is 3.45 in the morning. I am tired. I am running out of steam. I am 
only like a third of the way through the questions. So, uh, yeah, that's nightmarish to think about continued in part. Okay, it's bright and early the next morning after the previous recording, and we've got our first question from Sky, who says, Question branching off of all of that, what are the implications of media fulfilling the role of close relationships and connection? What do our favorite shows or games say and or reveal about each of us? Oh, buddy, everything. Absolutely everything. Like... I would say that's kind of the the foundation of my whole this whole thing I do with the uh the anime analysis because like fundamentally uh you know when I was growing up I was always into things that other people didn't seem to be into or seem to consider weird or off-putting because I grew up like listening to primarily alternative rock and I, you know, just, I don't know if I, I'm sure there are plenty of other kids who were listening to the same music I was, but I did not find them. I did not meet those kids or talk to them um, because perhaps, you know, they weren't alike. They weren't like me in other ways, you know, but um, like I, <clears throat> I, I was into stuff that generally like was popular, but somehow nobody around me knew about it. That was that was the, the 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 and it's because of the fact that I wasn't getting into things. Bec <coughs> it's because of the fact that I wasn't getting into things as a result of talking to people. Like, I think that you know most people their engagement with media uh, is more social in the first place. Like not just on social media, but all media because of the fact that you know they trust from their friends about like what they're going to get something out of watching it's like oh the people around me got something out of this and they are people who like things that i like so it would make sense that i would get just as much out of this thing as they would and i think that's the way that most people tend to look at things and they eventually gravitate towards hanging out with people with similar tastes to them because of the fact that your taste is so rooted in your personality, you know? And the more you identify that, the more likely your group is to become, like, tighter and tighter knit because you, you're you able to have conversations about the thing, you know, that pertain to your specific take, you know? So, like, I I think you can see this this most heavily in like couples who consume a lot of media who generally have very similar tastes and are you know in in similar worldviews so they're getting a lot of the same things out of the show or maybe they're interested in the fact that they get very different things out of it but happen to continue to um you know connect because uh, maybe it's a show that you know maybe it just so happens that all the stuff they like represents two different sides of the same worldview or something like that you know uh, whatever the case may be, um, you know, it says a lot about you, the things you like, because generally the reason I think we come to media is that our brain is subconsciously attempting to learn about itself. It is attempting to contextualize the world because uh, your brain knows that information is extremely important to adaptation. So, you know, if it wants to continue to adapt to the realities of the world, it needs to continue to know what the realities of the world are. And that's why I think, um, like, crime dramas are so massive. Because, like, they, even though they, they paint in extremely broad strokes and never give, like, a very good, you know, uh, portrait of whatever current event they might be speaking on, they will use current events in the news as reference points for their storytelling, and it... it it allows people to feel like they would know how to deal with these situations morally if they encountered them in real life, you know, like, or they know how those situations are being dealt with, you know, uh, as represented by, like, the, the moral front line, essentially, of, um, of politics. So, uh, well, not politics, but, uh, what would you call, like, the law, law and order, yeah. The moral front line of the law. Uh, so, um, you know, when I think about the appeal of anime, I mean, I, I said before that a big part of what got me into it is 
uh, the the fact that there were lots of effeminate male characters, and also the fact that uh, I could I first got into it through magazines, and I was already like a fan of magazines as a medium. Um, so like that that combination. I'm just now thinking about like how my enjoyment of magazines connects to uh, all the stuff I've been saying about like thinking in a in a circular way and how that connects to this game. Um, so I didn't really fully touch on that last night, but it was something that was in the back of my mind that uh, I wanted to talk about my connection to Samus and Metroid because uh, the Metroid games essentially what they're known for is that you enter an area. And you have to explore it thoroughly by, like, going back and forth, get like, memorizing the layout, getting new powers. And, like, each area is super atmospheric and interesting, but also foreboding. So it's like, everywhere you go, you're, like, kind of afraid, but at the same time, the place is kind of lit. And, you and like, you're interested in all the weird shit, even though, like, some of it is dangerous to you, like, a lot of it's not necessarily aggressive. And, like... The, 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 the enemies that are aggressive towards you are, like, humanoid, and you kind of, like, know why they're trying to fuck with you. Whereas all this other stuff is, like, mysterious, and you're not really sure of its intentions, and you have to kind of navigate that yourself as you play, you know? And, like, uh, and the theme of motherhood runs through all the games and was honestly my introduction to the concept of Metroid because, like, um, I my first game console was an N64, there was no Metroid game on the N64. So uh, my introduction to Samus was through Super Smash Bros. and through Nintendo Power. But there was a uh, a fan had written in one time talking about how much they loved the end of uh, Super Metroid. And um, in, the, in the, the response, they mentioned the fact that, like, you know, the baby Metroid sacrifices itself to save Samus. Spoiler alert if you haven't played Super Metroid. I mean, this is the only plot beat of the game. Uh, is that uh, at the end... So, okay, the plot of Metroid... It, I can literally summarize the plot of all the games in, like, a second, because it's that simple. Is that, like, there's these evil space pirates led by Mother Brain... Uh, which is just a literal giant brain in a jar. And um, they are trying to use these species called Metroids that are like life-sucking fucking uh, brain. Uh, they, they latch onto your head and suck your brain. And, um, and they're fucking ill. And uh, they're trying to like use them to take over the galaxy or whatever. And Samus is a bounty hunter who shows up to stop them, <coughs> and she does. Uh, and blows up the planet and you know, destroying all the Metroids, eliminating the Metroid threat. However, in uh, Metroid 2, which, uh, and by the way, it's, it's basically just Alien. It's basically just a video game adaptation of Ridley Scott's Alien. Um, so, the, the, the second game, Samus finds out there's another planet where 37 Metroids have survived and are, like, trying to you know, reestablish themselves. And so you go there and you have to, I think you have to fight Mother Brain again because she's also there trying to, like, cultivate the Metroids. Uh, but you, you, you kill all these Metroids. However, at the end, there's a baby Metroid and the baby Metroid hatches from an egg and the first thing it sees is Samus. So it thinks that Samus is its mom. And so Samus decides not to eliminate the baby Metroid and to take it with her. Uh, but then... In uh, Super Metroid, the, uh, I believe it's Mother Brain, like, comes back again and ca kidnaps the baby Metroid and takes it to another planet. So, um, and, and Ridley's there again, um, but at the end of the game, you... you you beat Mother Brain, but then she turns into, like, a big fucking monster thing. And then Baby Metroid, like, defends Samus, absorbs all this power, and becomes, like, super big. And fucking sacrifices itself to save Mommy Samus. It's a beautiful story. Uh, and uh, then there's uh, Metroid Fusion, where Samus has to fucking fight her shadow self. And it's, uh, sick. Um, but, yeah, so, like, I read that in Nintendo Power, and I remember feeling very strongly about, like, that plot beat, um, but, you know, not knowing anything else about these fucking games or how to play them, I didn't have the consoles, 
And like when I was a kid, I had this epic fantasy that I was going to, uh, you know, create a design a video game and sell my design document to Shigeru Miyamoto for two million dollars and buy every video game console so I could play every game that I had wanted to play that I'd read about in Nintendo Power. Well, boy, if I had known that emulation was going to be a thing and that money is fucking useless. So, uh, yeah, obviously money's not useless, um, but it's uh, it's not as important as I thought it was when I was a kid, where I literally thought I needed $2 million in order to uh, achieve the things I wanted to in life. <laughs> uh, so... And that that feeling never quite disappeared from my brain until more recently, I think. Uh, but yeah, like, so I I I um, my cousin was a big time Samus player in Smash, and that got me interested in in trying out the character, and then I became a really big Samus player. And Samus's playstyle in Smash is this very like i think i mentioned this on last night's part that like it's all about kind of uh avoiding the like the people around you and like just like keeping track of everything going on and being the person who like stands on the outside and just like you know peppers people from afar at least that's the way i play and everybody finds it really fucking annoying uh but uh you know it's a it's an apt metaphor for the way I've approached every other element of my life until now. But like, it's not the only way you can play Samus. You can play Samus in a way where she is up close and personal. And it just so happens that my favorite Smash player who plays Samus, Hugs, is uh, an, like the most personable guy on the planet. Definitely uh, a role model for me in terms of how to uh, how to be how to be a nicer person, you know, um, cause Hugs, Hugs knows how to be like, how to be like, uh, you know, like jokey and, and shit without, um, without seeming mean spirited, you know, uh, and I, I, I'm not as good at that, <laughs> you know, so if anything, I prefer to just not even try, like, I, I, I don't necessarily prefer like to, try to be funny all the time which is why i do more like analytical low-key content and stuff like this you know where i just like answer questions very sincerely because like i don't know there's a lot of like sensitive people out there who really aren't gonna get it if you make it a joke and you know i was one of those people growing up so like it wouldn't be helpful to my own younger self who needed to hear things like what i'm saying um, for me to, you know, be snarky about it. Anyway, that's not really part of the point. Um, so, you know, Samus is uh, a a woman who wears a heavy suit of armor that completely obscures her identity to the point that, like, the most common remark you will hear about Samus from, like, people who played Metroid 1 is that they were really surprised when it turned out to be a girl at the end because... They were projecting onto this character the whole game, you know, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's a girl, you know, and like not to say that people took it negatively or anything. If anything, people were just like, oh, like probably little boys were pretty into it because she's in a bikini, um, you know, but like that again, these are all like the things I knew about Samus, like as like the first things I knew, you know, like before I actually played any of the games. I didn't anticipate that, like, the style of how Metroid is played is something that resonates with me so much. And, like, I am obsessed with Metroid-style games and not Metroidvanias because Metroidvania is more about, like, continual short-term reward in the process of long-term growth, like setting small goals for yourself and doing, like, lots of repetitive action. Um, and, like... You know, like, for me, it, for my mind, like, that's the kind of, um, that's the kind of side that I kind of tap into when I'm trying to do something more masculine, you know, uh, is like the, the, the grinding, the, 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 it's like male masturbation, you know, like, it's literally just about 
rubbing up and down until you get a nut, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's boring. It's literally utilitarian. And, uh, and I have no interest in, in like, you know, purely utilitarian, like, act. It's like, there, there's no feeling there. So there's, I mean, there, I guess there can be feeling, but it's not a feeling that I personally connect with or understand, you know? So, uh, like, that's why I, it's a challenge for me to, to consider it, um, feeling, you know? I don't want to knock anybody who, like, you know, is, <laughs> you who gets something out of being that way. Okay, I guess I can't, like, missile that from down here for some reason. I don't know what difference it makes. But, uh, yeah, so, I guess I finished talking about why I connect with Samus and these games. But, like, <clears throat> you know, like, the thing that so many people don't like about Metroid is what I like about it. Is that it's a game where you just get lost and wander around and, like you know, become familiar with the environment until you reach a point where, like, you feel comfortable there and you're not threatened and you do feel as though you can, like, express yourself mechanically. And, like, uh, the reason that we're playing Metroid Prime is that this is pretty much the only video game that I am actually good enough at that I could feel, like, completely comfortable in it. And it's funny I say that because if you've seen my video about Metroid Prime, it's all about the evolution of how I did not feel that way growing up. Like, this was my, uh, this and Fusion were my first Metroid games. I loved Fusion. I loved Zero Mission. I beat both of those as a kid. This game was so terrifying and foreboding to me. Like, these fucking things. When I was a kid, even just watching my cousin play this game, uh, this was the scariest fucking monster I've ever seen. This thing that I just killed in three seconds and made look like chump shit. Like, I didn't know what to do when I encountered that thing as a kid. So, like, it's the scariest fucking thing you've ever seen in your goddamn life. And, uh, you know, even though, like, I loved, loved, loved the atmosphere, loved the music, I loved this game... I was really bad at it. I didn't understand how to play it. I just wanted to wa run around in it. And I kept reaching choke points in the game where it gets really hard and I just could not fucking figure out what to do. Until, like, I got better at video games in the sense that I came to understand, like, that, like, basically playing video games is about being extremely observant of everything the game is asking of you. And, like... I tend to approach games selfishly. Like, I know what I want out of the game. I know I want to enjoy the atmosphere and music, but that's not what the game is asking of me. The game is asking of me to learn the mechanics and conquer the challenge. And, like, I think that it's just, it's, it's like, hard for me to imagine that that's going to be fun because it seems like work, you know? But once you actually do that work, then you realize that it, it makes... It makes it so it stops being work once you've done it. And then if the game is good, if 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 that atmosphere is really worth, you know, losing yourself in, the game becomes even more fun once you understand the mechanics because then you can really express yourself in that environment. And there's there's not a lot of video games that I connect with enough that I'm willing to do that, you know? Like uh, like something like uh, like Grand Theft Auto, a lot of people love those games because of the expressiveness. Because you can basically, you know, in a in a simulation of something resembling reality, uh, just spread absolute chaos or you know simulate any any random like idea that's been in your mind. You know, and like I was never very interested in exploring a simulation of a reality that I already found scary enough and like the stuff that the stuff that people wanted to do in grand theft auto only made me more afraid of being in the world you know like the fact that that was a game that other kids liked really scared me when i was a kid because it, it literally is a game about violence in my mind you know and i you may have noticed from the games i play on this show i don't necessarily favor games about violence um which is ironic because Growing up, all I played was action games because I just, like, well, until I got into RPGs and then I became all about that uh, as a teenager. But it's just like, you know, it, it's it's the projection. It's just the constant sense of like, oh, well, I have to project how much of a boy I am and how much I like cool shit, even though I'm literally horrified by violence and, like, you know, can't even watch movies where people uh, get killed in them, you know? Like, 
it's 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 a weird duality to to live under but um you know as i grew up i came to be able to handle violence uh because i realized that like you know i am a coward like i cannot make it through life being a coward i need to you know learn how to I need to learn how to embrace some form of masculinity in order to protect myself because nobody is going to come in and be a knight in shining armor to protect me, especially when I am in no way a adorable princess, you know, um, even if I'm now treated like one uh, by uh, by my uh, my sweet significant other. But all right, we're going back to Talon King. Okay. Yeah, I know what it wants me to do. Um, it wants me to go all the way the fuck back across the world, but that's fine. That's fine. There's probably a shortcut I can open. Um, fuck all these guys. But yeah, uh, <clears throat> um, I think I pretty much made whatever point I was trying to make. I know I fucking stopped answering the question a while ago, and so this episode's gonna be j just as insanely long as I was afraid it would be. Uh, your lack of people you can relate- oh, this is from the Ravenous Lamppost. Your lack of people you can relate to and trust is the fault of liberals, corporate corporations, and politicians who have done everything they can to erase the nuclear family unit for the purpose of isolating vulnerable children like you were and giving them degenerate outlets such as transgenderism. I used to hate people like you before I realized that if this system, which I've been red-pilled on for some time now, truly exists, then you must also be a victim of it. Well, I mean, I don't disagree with you in the sense that I'm a victim of the system as we all are, um... You know, in, in in the sense that, like, yeah, everything bad about your life is, is the result of the fact that shit be the way it be. Um, and that runs a lot deeper than just the disillusion of the nuclear family, which, like, when you say the nuclear family, like, there's this... People seem to have this idea now that the nuclear family just means the family unit. Like, okay, I think this is like a millennial and Gen Z misunderstanding of the term, um that like people are thinking of it like oh i'm a millennial and i grew up in a nuclear family because i had two parents and a brother and sister and we lived in the suburbs and like that is true but like specifically like the idea of the nuclear family is like the totally self-sufficient family because like Back in the 50s, when we were trying to, like, pump up our economy to compete with Russia, as well as to, you know, and the, using the tactic of, like, scaring people that Russia is after us with nuclear bombs, like, the idea of the nuclear family is that your house is a nuclear fallout shelter, you know, that, like, you have everything you could possibly need in your house, and, like, that is the birth of, like, the absurd consumer culture that we've come to live in. However, what they chose to sell people changed over time. Because back in the 50s, it was very clear to people that they were, like, they were strictly in, like, a the category of being a man or a woman. But what that meant was not codified. Like, if you were a woman, you thought, I am a woman. If you were a man, you thought, I am a man. And you just behaved the way that you were, and it wasn't really called into question necessarily whether you were, like, you know, whether you were supposed to be, or, like, whether, you, you know, whether men are supposed to act this way. You, Your understanding of how men act is based on the men you know. If a man acts differently, um, who, who you know, and you, you would assume he was foreign before you would assume that he was, you know, some other gender or some other identity, right? So, when you reach the era of marketing, where they have to try to sell shit to men and women, they have to really emphasize the difference between them, you know? And, like, granted, I'm not trying to say that, uh, that there weren't, like, hardcore gender, um, you know, stereotypes and, like, and, and, and things being forced on society. I mean, women couldn't even vote. Uh, they were, you know, not able, they were literally not allowed to wear the same kind of clothes as men. And, like, you know, these, these things were enforced in the household, first and foremost, culturally, through generations, through the presence of the family, all trying to preserve the same ideas uh, of what came before, you know? And in an environment that restrictive, um, the, like, 
people just did not consider their identity to be something that like was supposed to be embraced it's like your identity is supposed to be suppressed you're supposed to sublimate everything in your mind to god brainwash yourself into just holding up society's values that's what like collectivist culture is about it's about just you know becoming becoming the same person as everybody around you even you know if by whatever means necessary we'll put it that way and if you cannot succeed at that you cannot be a part of the culture you know that's how a monoculture uh functions so like in a culture like that the like those kinds of cultures seem hyper functional because the people in control maintain control uh the the culture survives in that people continue to live and anything that doesn't fit into it is exiled or destroyed but this culture will never evolve nothing will change about it it will just have to maintain itself in an unending state uh because like it cannot anything that challenges it has to be destroyed and like eventually there's going to be a rogue element that becomes frustrated enough to either dismantle the system or to escape it and that is where a new culture will form or will cultural reform will happen and these are inevitabilities because it is in our nature to attempt to evolve it is in the nature of the species to attempt to find ways forward and i'm not saying that it's evolving to like call yourself uh, a woman or whatever but it is evolving to understand that you know the way that we define identity um and the way that we allow marketing to define identity in particular uh and 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 you know cultural norms has stagnated evolution that like people trying to fit themselves into the box of what society asks of them when they have potential that goes vastly beyond that if they were to do something differently is a stifling of evolution. So the question is, how do we best encourage people to find the thing that they will be the most useful at? And it's we have to understand usefulness in different terms from the way we have. This is why, like, uh, I was a big supporter of Andrew Yang and his universal basic income ideas when he was campaigning. Can't say I particularly support him right now because he's kind of like a shill. Uh, but, you know, he his idea of UBI was that it was most beneficial to women, uh, particularly mothers, because there is no financial, like, backing for motherhood. Like, you, if your goal is just to, like, help people to learn and grow, like, you can become a teacher, which is a shitty job where you work in the worst fucking system, the most corrupt, you know, uh, one of the most corrupt systems in America and you just watch kids fucking fall through the cracks and then kill yourself when, uh, you know, you cannot, um, you cannot, uh, justify being a part of that, uh, system and watching it corrode through the souls of children. Um, you know, if you just want to be like a mom who raises a kid well, uh, like, good luck because I don't know if you're going to find a find a husband who can find a job uh that won't keep him away you know and make it so he's a non-presence in the child's life it's just like you need both parents as a kid and like especially in the early years there's there i don't even know if there is paternity leave in america um you know maternity leave is is not nearly what it should be the way that it is in some countries for both uh some countries have healthy relationships with these things compared to america uh ours is really bad and like even outside of that like like being a good parent is more important than fucking working at target for society like it's literally a more important job to america's future that peop that children have their parents it's in fact like there's nothing more important like uh, and that the parents be educated and have the space to raise the children well you know like it's it's not easy to be a good parent but like even being a like uh, to me being a good parent is just like if you can fucking do better um than than your own parents and you know and keep the chain going long enough that something good comes out of it then uh you know that's kind of the best you could hope for 
is that like you keep a chain of influence going that eventually reaches a place where it is uh it is helpful you know um and how do you do that you have to just learn and grow yourself so that you can impart that growth on to others you know um and it's my responsibility as a content creator to kind of stay in front of myself like i think a lot of people's uh struggle with my content was that they felt that i was not saying anything new for a long time that like i think that because of the fact that i did not start trusting people again and start feeling safe like going to the next level of the things that i was exploring in my mind like you know outside of my music like and i think that's why my music became less comprehensible to people because like back in the bedroom bedrock era or even the gay and dead era people were listening to all these podcasts and all these things I'm, I'm talking about where I'm, I'm covering the same subjects as the music. So people understand where this music's coming from. And that wasn't the case with something like the unknown tape where like, I literally am talking about events in my life that are not being publicly shared that I'm not ready to address because I don't know how to put it into words beyond this. And I want to be accepted without having to, you know, um, anyway, all these topics keep running backwards into each other as I as I reconnect the dots back and forth around the circle. Uh, let's move on to the next question. I'm a wizard somehow, says, Are feelings not fundamentally irrational and basically meaningless on their own to the world outside of your mind? That's what I seem to be confused about and why the contrary perspective seems to put the brain's emotions and personal experiences of a human on a pedestal when there is so much more that determines you that is out of your control than not. I think this is a way to make people feel they are in control of themselves rather than acknowledging basic aspects of reality we have all come to understand. We only use our minds and emotions if we have nothing else to go on, but otherwise we should be seeking understanding through external rather than internal. I think you are absolutely wrong because emotions are the same thing as understanding and intelligence they are just not in words because you have not found those words yet should you seek the words i think you should try to get whatever you can out of your head to whomever you can you know i think that uh my struggles to communicate over the years are because like i you know understood things emotionally that I did not need to explain to understand, uh, but my my understandings were accurate. You know, like the reason that I, as a kid, was considered to be exceptionally intelligent and put in all these gifted programs and shit is that I just knew the answers to things. I was not being asked to constantly show my work. I was not being asked to do tons of homework. I was not being like pushed to a higher level of like lexical proof. And when I was. I did not understand why it was necessary and it was really frustrating because it was just like I don't know how to explain how I know this shit, you know? And so like all my communications would fall flat because in my mind the things I was saying made sense and I couldn't figure out why they didn't make sense. So it's like, you know, to say that like emotional thinking is is like is not based on something like no it's it's that lexical thinking is based on the emotions you have the emotional response first that's what gets you you know curious about it and then you try to figure out why you're having that emotional response you know and like you have to constantly challenge your reasoning because like it's easy to jump to conclusions and like highly emotional people do that they jump to conclusions and they become paranoid and that's the kind of stuff that I did until I learned about analysis. And analysis is how I learned to be, uh, you know, how I learned to rationalize the world, how I learned to explain myself to other people, how I learned to break down my emotions into words. But you can only analyze emotions that you confront. You can only analyze emotions that you, you know, like, I mean, if you have the emotion and you bury it, then you will not be able to analyze it. And if you if you're doing if if you are living under a false pretense of who you are, then you will lack the understanding to approach the world effectively towards your intentions because your intentions are deeply rooted inside of you. And there are some people who have to literally change their intentions and like and like repress because their intentions at the core are negative that like at the core they have anger because they were treated 
poorly from the beginning and they did not receive the the uh the um you know the unconditional love that that would make them feel like justified in themselves as a human being you know like and and they they feel this just either anger at themselves or anger at society or at individuals who they project their that anger onto you know and so for those people if they want to become better it's it's like they they really have to find a source of like projection of unconditional love um you know in their lives and like a lot of people turn to god you know i think that religion is is such a powerful force for people because it uh it, it allows them to think okay well there is you know there is somebody looking out for me and as long as that's the case then uh you know i can try my best to to put aside my feelings and be good because that's what god would want me to do you know but like for me it's more like i had to learn the violent feelings like i i was so ra raised in such a coddled environment raised in such an emotionally inviting environment that like i did not understand the idea that there were people who didn't have my best intentions in mind who you know weren't going to try to protect me innately um and that like i should not try to involve myself with or try to like help out you know like uh, in in the reason I connected so strongly with Araragi in Monogatari is that like uh like his character flaw is that he's too helpful. Like he constantly involves himself in other people's business, overextending himself to the point where it is a detriment to his relationships because like he's putting the needs of other people above the people who he's supposed to be helping, who who, you know, need enough of him that they, they he cannot be splitting his attention with other people if he wants to truly take care of them you know and so like that is something that i connected with and it's like uh i used to really relate to the the infp um you know categorization in uh in in myers briggs because of the fact that it describes that it's basically being like so sensitive that you won't involve yourself in anything because like just the emotional pain of even thinking about other people's problems um, is, like, too much. And, like, if you can't solve them, then you feel like it's your fault somehow, you know, or, like, you failed them. And, like, those are all kinds of things that I deal with. And, and those are, you know, more reasons for my uh, avoidantness up until the point where I kind of desensitized myself to the fact that, like, okay – Eventually, I had to understand not only are there people with bad intentions, but there might be, like, even more of them than good guys. And that, like, you know, also, I guess part of it was convincing myself that I was not one of those people. That, like, you know, as 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 somebody who's assigned male at birth, feeling like a woman and also being attracted to women, like, I understand why, like – a lot of women are afraid of of trans women because like you know we we like for me personally i have male instincts that i do not like that i didn't really appreciate how much i didn't like them until i started coming out and and especially in uh, in dealing with uh with may because of the fact that she you know was in the closet about being a lesbian I was in the closet about being a woman and we were both projecting a lot onto the other person. Like I think things that we wanted from ourselves and like the more I understand that, the more it's like, you know, the more she treats me like the, uh, like a woman and the more I treat her more like a man, it seems like we are both happier being treated that way, you know? And like, and our acceptance of being treated the other way was more out of, like an understanding of like, okay, like, you know, this person needs me to be like that. So that's what I'm going to be. Um, and like, you know, because we love and respect each other, like we are willing to do that for each other. We are willing, like, I still will, you know, if she needs me to be, you know, a certain way, I could be that way. But like, I think we associated it like, oh, well, these things are my responsibility because I'm the boy and these things are my responsibility because I'm the girl. Even if both of us considered ourselves gender fluid and, and sort of androgynous, like, I think we, we just assumed that we would be worse at certain things because of 
not having been educated in those things growing up, not having, you know, uh, or just not having the, you know, not having the body of a person who would, who would be better at those things. But like, in reality, there's a lot of stuff that like, that is considered culturally feminine that I am just more naturally acclimated to than she is. And a lot of masculine things she's more naturally acclimated to than I am. And like, by not projecting those, you know, those ideas onto each other, it's made our relationship better and happier and more functional and made us more capable of social interaction because we feel more confident in ourselves, you know? So like all of that is why I think that the, uh, the trans experience is important, I guess, is what I'm trying to say is what, what the answer to this, uh, right. Well, I, I, I'm like simultaneously answering you and that last guy, uh, because, yeah, like, I, I think that the the nuclear family unit, you know, is a is an isolationist emotional unit that is a culture unto itself in which people cannot realize things because they cannot communicate with the family. Like, everybody – like, the father of the household basically decides what the worldview of the house is and then – Everybody else is, like, sublimated into that worldview at the cost of their identity. And, like, showing the problems with this setup is what all, like, you know, family sitcoms are about. Is like, exploring how to better the nuclear family by being more accepting and, like, showing dads, like, how to come to terms with their you know, their emotions that have been created by living in a consumerist society by playing into that consumerism in the the actual way that the show is presented by being like a television show and involving that in it, you know. Um, so, like, you know, but most of the shows are about, like, bettering your family unit. And I do think, like, I think family is tremendously important. I think having your parents there is tremendously important in some form. It doesn't have to be your biological parents. Like, you're not fucked if you don't have your biological parents there. But you need a family unit. You need a structure of unconditional love being given to you. And your family can be a chosen family of friends who respect you and your needs, you know. But, like, you need people in your life who are expressing love to you so you can then express that love forward and project it forward. And if I think that there are a lot of people who understand this, but they refuse to accept the love of anybody who doesn't understand them. And that's the kind of person that I've been is that it, my mentality was like, okay, well, you know, like, it's fine if you love me unconditionally, but I cannot express myself if you can't understand me. And, like, when I try to express myself, it's confusing and you complain about it, you know, because you don't understand that this is self-expression because you don't understand the expression. And that's how, you know, that's how I feel about, like, most of the people that I dealt with in my life, both on and off the Internet, pretty much, even, like, my friends who do respect me and who I trust enough to think that, yes, they they do accept me to some degree, but, like, there's always something I have to cut off because it's annoying. There's always something I have to to shut out and I just thought that was always going to be the case. Like I did not believe that I would ever find somebody who would accept all the annoying things about me until I met May. And like it's not that like I'm trying to fucking push that and be as obnoxious as possible. Like there are certain things that are legitimately annoying that I like you know if I can if it's complained about and I recognize the problem, I'll yeah, I agree. I should stop this habit, you know, but like, um, all right, this is where I have to now go all the way back to where I was and not go explore the pirate frigate because that will fuck me over. Although I can get an energy tank if I go down there. Fuck it. We'll do it. We're going into the briny deep, the brony deep, uh, Anyway, I feel like I answered that question well enough, right? Uh, Wyatt Augustinyak says, Hey, Digi, do you think being a normie is just a facade? Maybe everyone has a weird side that they repress due to social pressure, or maybe being a normie comes from a lack of self-reflection and critical thinking, maybe something else entirely. I think it's a combination of those things. I think that definitely everybody has something that they're repressing, and a lot of people think they need to. Some people might legitimately have to for a while until they can, you know, understand it, what they're repressing well enough to incorporate 
you know, elements of who they, how they feel back into their identity. But, um, you know, I think that like most people have something that they, they feel and they don't know that they can, they don't think they can express it to anybody because they're not sure anybody else feels that way or if it's okay to feel that way. And I, my stance is that it's okay to feel whatever way you feel as long as you're not hurting anybody and you, you know, uh, hopefully can find, you know, if you, if you have that acceptance, hopefully you can find a way to make peace with the feelings that you have, you know, that, uh, that you're struggling with. But like, you know, and I want to offer whatever help I can, but I'm, you know, I'm not paid to do that. So I can only go so far, uh, but like, you know, I, I think like, not that I'm not going to try to go, you know, all the way for the people I really care about, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, I think that the lack of self-reflection and critical thinking is a result of repression. It's a result of like, you cannot analyze yourself because that would require you to confront feelings that you cannot confront because you are not comfortable with confronting them, you know, because oftentimes those feelings are probably tied to somebody close to you, uh, that you you know, have complicated feelings about your relationship with. Like, that's usually, you know, like, especially people who have dealt with, like, oh, I guess I can't continue without the fucking ice beam. Okay, I don't know why I thought I could come here at this point, but, uh, I guess I cannot. But yeah, like, I, I, like, I don't want to talk about anybody specific, but I've, uh, Somebody who I, you know, knew in the past, like, uh, had, uh, like, had dealt with, like, a sexual assault from a family member that, like, she wouldn't talk about or wouldn't, like, tell anybody had happened because, ultimately, she was worried it would tear the family apart, you know? And, like, I think that... You know, the fact that she even, like, could acknowledge that is healthier than being in a state of, like, just completely not even acknowledging to yourself that something happened. Um, but I do think that there are a lot of people who blame, who blame the trauma on the reason that they are feeling the way they are. And I think that the trauma will complicate your feelings, but I don't think it creates your feelings. I think that most likely... The trauma is a result of those feelings. Either because, like, okay, so I don't have any memories or anything of having anything, like, sexual assault happening to me. So I don't know if, like, I don't think it ever did. Um, you know, if I had any memories like that, I repressed them uh, effectively, I guess. But, like, I connect to people who have experienced those things. Maybe just because the feelings I had about society, um, you know made me feel similarly or, or gave me similar paranoias. I don't know. Um, obviously not as intense as a lot of those people, which is why I've been able to kind of like, you know, recover from my own paranoia, which makes me think that I, you know, didn't suffer this particular kind of thing. But like, it wouldn't have surprised me because I was an effeminate child and I was, there was a lot of adults around me in my life because like my parents do a lot of parties and you know, hung out with lots of like stoners and weirdos and like, I don't know, people who I'm sure are, are good. And, uh, but like, there's a reason my parents stopped throwing parties because like they found like Coke on the toilet seat once and were like, we got to stop this, you know, like, um, I'm just saying that like, not to say that anything like likely happened to me, but more what I'm trying to suggest is that, uh, you know, that I was that like, I understand that people, look at you in a lot of different ways when you are different and like even though it took me a long time to appreciate what these lyrics really meant even when i was a kid i always really connected with the uh the marilyn manson cover of sweet dreams where he says some of them want to use you some of them want to be used by you some of them want to abuse you and some of them want to be abused you know and it's like when I look at people, I see all of those possibilities of like, you know, maybe this person wants to use me and that could be useful. Like, you know, maybe I can be useful to this person. Maybe I maybe, you know, maybe this person can be useful to me. 
Or maybe this person wants to hurt me or wants, for some weird reason, wants me to hurt them, you know? Um, and, uh, or maybe I want to be hurt by this person, even, you know? Um, not usually. <laughs> I'm not much for pain. Um, I'm more of a, I'm more of the soft type, but, uh, at the same time, I, I am kind of, I do greatly relate to and appreciate and probably, by which I mean low-key probably will find myself involved with, uh, like, bondage and immobilization, like, as a means, as an act of trust. The idea of sort of just, uh, you know, like, feeling comfortable enough with somebody that you would give them complete control over your, uh, you know, physical well-being, um... But, you know, it's it's funny because, well, I won't go into any more details. Um, but, yeah, that's just like I, 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 I read the book on uh, Mardok Scramble where the author clearly himself is like trying to flirt with these things by talking about like, uh, you know, oh, I, I talked to a friend who told me about what's the appeal of bondage and it sure was interesting, you know, and I was like, OK. All right, buddy boy. I see right through you. Now you got me caught in the act. You bring the thought back. I'm telling you that. I see it right through you. Anyway, uh, T Attic 777 says, A late comment now, but when Digi talks about denial and avoidance, then leading to not asking for help, to me that sounds like feelings of shame, like an ugly girl is only meaningful and shameful figure in the context of a beautiful girl being something to be proud of for a person. Shame is ambivalent emotion, IMO. To care for yourself and experiencing continuous shame, I agree, means asking for help, going towards rather than avoiding yourself or others. Total agreement. Um, and I think that I, in my life, have surrounded myself uh, with a lot of deeply ashamed and guilt-ridden people because I am the same way. And that sense of shame and like my, my brother Victor is even worse about being like deeply uh, guilt ridden as a as a flaw uh, comes from the fact that like my parents were very obsessively self-sufficient um, because they really did not have any kind of like support network and like their families are, are full of kind of, you know, pe people who who came to rely on them, like basically my parents always ended up being the people who were being relied on and they took care of tons of people like you know my friends were always at my house because my house was the place where you could be yourself and and have fun and and there was not strict rules and you know like my parents were just way more liberal than most people's parents so like it was an environment where where people like to hang out and chill and where also like their families, you know, often needed to fall back on us because like they were in, you know, financial uh, bad situations or just, you know, needing a place to crash for a while. And my dad had the means to take care of people. So he did, you know, and like so like, you know, I'm used to being in like a caregiving household, but like I also over the years saw like how th when you give to people they will take more like if, if they are not like the kinds of people who find themselves in those types of situations tend to be people who do not have the skills to figure out how to take care of themselves and oftentimes are the kinds of people who don't listen to any advice you give them and uh, you know continue to rely on you even though you and not like you know do anything that would help themselves because they cannot internalize the things that you are trying to say to them because they do not understand these kinds of like you know basic success strategies um and usually it's like out of some kind of warped sense of identity that is usually a result of some kind of repression so like that's the kind of things i've encountered throughout my life and you know, again, like I have this extremely strong urge to help people, but I also have been taken advantage of not only by extended family, but by the kinds of people I've tried to help online. And so like, you know, I, I think that I'm used to being around people who are in denial and avoidant. And I, 
don't think I ever realized that, like, like I I was exhibiting all the same traits as them while, but like, but with self, like, like you can be self aware about some of your denial and not all of it, if you know what I mean. It's like. Like, the fact that my whole persona on the internet was about constantly insisting on my authenticity. I mean, you should always be suspicious of anybody who insists too strongly about something because it means they're trying to convince themselves, you know? They're literally trying to convince themselves of how authentic they are. Um, and so, like, yeah. And, like, you, you know, I'm not out here right now bragging about how fucking truthful I am. I'm just telling you the truth. And it's evident in the fact that I'm doing it, you know? Um, because the truth is recognizable to uh, people who understand how to find it. And that's why people always... People who are, you know, more emotionally intelligent were always kind of, like, confused by my videos because they see the disconnect that even I am too autistic to see myself, you know? And obviously, the more autistic elements of my audience are, you know, probably dealing with the same confusion in their own minds, that same disconnect. So, um, or, or some brand thereof. Anyway. Um, so yeah, like, I would say that the biggest thing that I didn't understand about myself, the biggest character flaw that I wasn't recognizing, um is that I am incredibly shallow about looks. And I finally understood this when I wrote the song Shallow, which is the song that, like, is uh, May's favorite song. She just appeared next to me right when I was about to say her name. It freaked me out. Uh, like, it was May's favorite song by me, um, and the lyrics of that song are literally just, like, me shitting on myself for being, like, ugly, fat, and lazy. Um... The lyrics, the, the the chorus of the song that's repeated incessantly is, I'm only ankles deep, I can't impress me, I only see beauty in things, uh, I only see beauty in terms of what is sexy, I'm not a good guy, I don't like anyone, but if someone says, hun, I want to fuck, I'm all but done. That's the chorus that's repeated over and over and over again throughout the song. So, you know, when I say I'm only ankles deep, and that I can't impress me, I mean, like, literally, like, in spite of everything that I've done, I am still not impressed with myself because I'm not what I want to be, which is, a, you know, like, a, a, well, it's not that I want to be a sexy girl at this point, but I think that's what I wanted to be, you know, it's like, I wanted to be a cute, sexy, attractive girl, and instead I'm, you know, as described in this song, which is, um, I say, got about as much charm as self-harm. I'm about as warm as a corporate email. Got no female friends, and I think that's probably my fault. Rough like asphalt. Tough with words and curses. Curt to a fault, and I skirt the issue. Satisfied to squirt through tissues. Plus, I talk about my dick like it's everybody's business. Come pay witness. Physical fitness is I lift a bit, but don't do shit besides. Ride is nice, but I'm only out at night to procure burgers and fries. And I eat like a garbage chute. I'm far from cute. Can't be much of a brute, but my sleazy needs got me up all night, nothing but red tube. So I'm saying, even though I cannot be much of a brute, I'm not, like, that masculine, but my sleazy needs will keep me addicted to pornography. And my what my sleazy need is, is the need to look at beautiful women, both as a mode of expressing sexual frustration towards, like, wanting to have sex, but also... Because it's the only way I can actually express femininity. The only way I, I know how to connect with my own female side, you know, as somebody living by themselves with, you know, nobody to really express that femininity to that I'm comfortable with doing it towards is through pornography, through projecting myself onto characters, you know. Uh, the second verse goes, never going to feel attractive, never going to be too active, only got a few more years till I'm over that hill and expectations go backwards. I'm a lazy bastard, smoking up a storm of tobacco like a little rascal, living in the big fiasco, trying not to be so hassled, maybe less a total asshole. But I don't see myself from the outside and I don't trust what I cannot see. If a ball of sleaze with some real bad teeth isn't what you all perceive, then I'm glad for that. But I'm still fat, and I still don't like dogs or cats, and I'm still a self-important fuck with a knack for embracing that. So this is just a list of everything I hate about myself. Um, and ultimately, what I hate about myself is that 
is that I'm shallow. It's not that I'm not beautiful. It's that I care so much about it that I am shallow and I'm attacking myself for this. And that was what May connected with is that she felt the same way, that she was obsessed with being attractive, obsessed with, you know, presenting as a hot girl, um, even though a lot of it was just her projection of, like, sexual frustration out of wanting to be with a hot girl because she really doesn't care. Like, it's, it's, it's so funny that, like, all of her... All of her, like, when she wears makeup or when she does, like, straightens her hair or when she, like, wears certain clothes, it's all out of how will people perceive me? Will people think that I look hot? Or, like, will they think I look like a woman? Am I going to be accused of looking like a man? Am I going to be accused of looking like a lesbian? Because throughout her life, people were constantly insisting that she looked like a man or looked like a lesbian or was masculine. And she's like, why, why do I have to be that when, you know, I'm a girl? And, like... It's similar to how I felt, you know, in the way I described my own feelings growing up. Um, but, like, through no longer feeling as though, like, she has to be tasked to, you know, perform that way. It's like, I've come to recognize that, like, certain things that, like, certain ways that I treated her because I thought this is how she wants to be treated because that's, like, the way she, you know like projected before it's like now that i can act that way and she can react to me it doesn't seem like it, it seems like if i react to her the way that she would have reacted to me it, it makes her just as happy if that makes sense so it's just kind of like okay like uh trying to reread yeah it's like through the acceptance of somebody else thinking that I am a cute girl, I don't feel the need to, like, prove it to myself. It's like, I don't feel the need to look in the mirror and say, like, oh, that's a cute girl. Like, I I would, I think that person passes. I think that person, uh, you know, is attractive. Like, I think May is attractive. I'm supposed to be attracted to the person that I'm with not not myself you know like my my mission is not to be attracted to myself my mission is to be uh you know att attractive to the person that i want to be attractive to you know and i already am you know i always have been because even though like may is even though she was a closet lesbian i was enough of a woman uh from the start to uh to be appealing as a man i guess and, uh, you know, she loved me for my mind and not my appearance in the first place. Because as May has put it to me, like, she generally does not feel any attraction to guys. And I always thought it was very strange that she, I mean, initially she did not even consider herself bisexual. Like, she insisted that she was just like, like, she j she's like, oh, I'm not bi, I just think girls are hot. Like, I don't want to fuck girls, I just like girls. Like, but meanwhile, like she thinks like every girl is hot like <laughs> like just as much as i do you know and i'm like okay well like there's no difference between your attraction to girls and my attraction to girls like there's i don't i don't see the uh the difference and like and for her with guys the only guys she's attracted to is based on their personality and the only personality that she likes in guys is like like her favorite male characters are like double d from ed ed and eddie and like uh the, the 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 nerdy guy from dragon maid and it's just like all the guys you like are like extremely effeminate and or gay like you know uh it's really funny um which you know goes for some other people i could speak of but i won't as well but uh you know in the same sense all the girls i like are masculine so it's like even though I am into girls, I like girls who are more manly than me, you know? Um, and the reason I think I like girls is that my impression of guys is that they are too insensitive. That, like, I've... I've I, I don't know. I guess it would be different because I've never presented my intentions to a guy correctly. Like, there are, there are definitely a few guys, you know, in my life who it's like if I had been... If I had been acting as a girl and they had accepted that, 
and like and been attracted to me as a girl then i think i would have been into them but like what i'm into in them is like again the sensitivity it's like uh, like i uh, i want somebody who's just slightly more masculine than me you know and so like i think i see that in i i think that me and may thought that like i was just slightly more masculine than her and like that was the projection that we had because of the you know the denial and avoidance of having to like address the idea that it might be the other way around you know and and the insecurities that we would both have about ourselves um you know if we were 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 you know recognized that we were the, per, not performing the gender that we wanted to and then you know seeing all the gaps in like what we think we would need to do to be effective as that you know like it's funny because I'm obsessed with moms and May is obsessed with dads. And so, like, in my mind, I see it as, like, I, I feel like the type of person that she wants to be, whether she is a man or a woman, is a dad, you know? And, like, the type of person that I want to be, whether I was a man or a woman, is a mom. And, like, uh, and that's exactly what we projected onto each other is, like, oh, you'll make such a great dad. You'll make such a great mom. But it's, like... Yeah, but you're the one who wants to do that, you know? Like, you're the one who admires your dad. I'm the one who admires my mom, you know? Like, um, you could say that we we both searched for someone who, you know, I think was, like, an effective stopgap of those things. But, like, I am not at all similar to May's dad. She is not at all similar to my mom. Each of us is similar to that corresponding parent and looks up to them. So, like... You know, uh, I think that's 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 sort of where we connect, you know, and, um, you know, even just in the fact that, uh, like, I'm like liberal leaning and she's conservative leaning, you know, like even those those little those little odd things, I think, play into our, uh, you know, the core, the core of what we uh, feel in our identity on some level. Anyway, yeah. Uh, fuck shame. The faster you can get over shame, the faster you can be living to your, true, true to your intentions. And even if a lot of people will reject you, um, the reality is that everybody's rejecting you uh, because they are not seeing your true self in the first place. Like, there is no even you to reject until you are giving somebody something to reject. And, uh, you know, there are people out there who are patient and willing to deal with you, but like you have to in turn be patient and waiting for not only waiting to find those people, but waiting for them to be ready to help you and, and you know, have the time. Like, you know, I don't have enough time to do to to talk to absolutely everybody in any kind of meaningful context, you know. This is pretty much the furthest reach I can manage. Uh and this is pretty manageable for me so far. Um you know, it, it has gotten a little out of hand, obviously, with these episodes getting so long and, um, you know, me trying to uh, keep up with as much of the conversation as there is. But the, the comments have slowed down and the view counts, you know, uh, have not been the same on every episode. So I don't think it'll stay like crazy. But All right. Sunny Clips uh, says, been lurking since 2016. I've also recently gone from being casually non-binary while still presenting as my assigned gender to realizing I'm more directly trans than I thought. So I've been relating a lot to the recent content. Understanding what you mean when you say you always speak in metaphors has cleared up a lot of misgivings I had about you previously. I think there are two qualities I've always enjoyed from you. One, your willingness to stick by extremely controversial opinions even when they literally get you labeled as a monster. And two, your philosophy around finding the perfect niche art that appeals to you specifically. I've always been jealous of your success with the latter as I find it very difficult to strongly attach to any piece of media and I sometimes wonder whether I'm even capable of falling in love with the work the way you describe. The closest I've come with was Kanye's discography. I don't even know what I like in media and find it hard to describe what I'm looking for when asking for recommendations. Do you have any advice on how to deal with this? Um, when it comes to not knowing what you like in media and not knowing how to ask for recommendations. I think, uh, well, I mean, for one thing, if you can, like, just make a list of all the things you like, uh, I can probably find some kind of common element in it if I, if I know enough of it. Um, I mean, Kanye's discography is almost characterized by his, uh, fucking 
bipolar, tripolar nature. Uh, but uh, depends on what albums you like the most, really. Like, um, you know, different favorites might might yield different impressions. But yeah, uh, I mean, the thing about getting labeled as a monster is that it's always a question of who is labeling you as a monster. I mean, as I've well established, when I was growing up, I was, you know, was was labeled as a monster for lots of reasons that I don't think were fair. And, um, you know, I had a real chip on my shoulder about it. And so, like, for me, it's kind of easy to be like, oh, well, you know you don't like like you don't like my stances well fuck you i know i'm right and like you know so like if you think i'm a monster it just means you are an idiot you know and like i think it's easy for people like me to overextend that where like like it's it's really not that big a deal to me if somebody's wrong for a second even if they're tremendously wrong like i mean there's an amount of wrong you can be, um, an amount of time you can be wrong where, where it becomes unacceptable. You know, those two things, those are the two, I guess, yeah, it's the depth of the wrongness and the length of the wrongness that matters. Like, the officer sitting on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes is about the, the greatest length and depth of wrongness that I can easily imagine, you know? But, like, a situation where somebody in response to that like, says some racist shit on Twitter, like, might be, you could consider it deeply wrong in that it, it, it seems to indicate a depth of wrongness within that person, uh, that, that permeates through, but, like, the result of that particular wrongness is a tweet, and, like, ultimately, if, if that's all we know that, that, like of this person is this tweet then it's like how do we really have enough context to like understand the intentions behind them as a human being you know like i say a lot of edgy shit i don't mean because it's funny uh and usually i try to be very obvious about what i do or don't mean but sometimes the frustration that i have is that it wouldn't be obvious to someone and so you know, it's like, it's, it, there's, I, I consider this to be like the way a bully thinks, essentially. This is basically what a tsundere does, is to blame you for not understanding them. You know, like, that is the tsundere way of, of thought. The, um, and, like, I totally connect with that. I totally get it. Um, well, I thought I would have to shoot this thing with a missile, but. Don't seem to want to open. Well, um, yeah, like, I, I guess I pretty much made that point. Um, as for, you know, falling in love with media, I think, you know, you just got to ask people, you just got to, like, tell people what you like and ask them based on that what they think you would like. That is basically how recommendations work. Um, and then you have to actually consume the recommendations because for me personally, um, I used to be really big into, like, giving people recommendations as, like, my primary way of communicating because, you know, I understand myself best through art. So it's like I want to show people how well I feel like I understand them by recommending things that I think will they'll get something out of. And so I really take my recommendations seriously. Uh, and so when people don't watch the stuff that I recommend them because they, they think they, – they just assume they won't care – and they just say they're going to do it as part of polite conversation, uh, unforgivable. So, um, I only recommend things to people if I'm, if, if I'm completely confident that they are going to check it out. But, uh, yeah, I'm always willing to, uh, to help somebody out in that regard. And of course, if you just want to watch good anime and you generally agree with my, like, worldview, watch all the shows I like, because as, I, as I've established on this episode, my taste is entirely dependent on my worldview. Um, all right, let's do the next one. Xana Durian says, God fucking damn it. Digi, I've been trying to write a particular thing to ask you, a particular comment. However, due to YouTube sucking shit through a silly straw, no matter how I type it, the end result comes at as an, 
and is an unformatted blobby mess despite the fucking fact that I know I'm typing shit correctly. So fuck that question and fuck this. I find myself aggravated and extremely angry about things such as this. Small things, big things, I get frustrated and pissed off about it. What do you do with your anger, Digi? For myself, I typically either play an instrument, violently draw something, or scream into a pillow and hit another pillow. I suppose you could call my anger alternatingly constructive or destructive. Do you ever have similar feelings of destructive anger? The ugly, violent kind of anger born out of frustration or constructive anger and beautiful, passionate defiance encapsulated by the phrase fuck you yourself absolutely i am not like i'm a very non-violent person i don't like I, like i feel embarrassed if i even like feel violent enough to like hit something like like not like I, I have this very strong memory in my mind of a time when i was really emotional at like 16 or 17 and like my room was kind of a mess and i was like looking for something to take out my frustration on but like i didn't want to damage anything that i own or like you know like or be like embarrassed that i had like done some kind of damage so instead i just kind of like kicked over a fan like a standing up fan like a tall fan and like i just remember like feeling like legitimately like what the fuck is like like wh who like what is this man like you know like you just kicked over a fan like uh like is that like, I don't know, I just thought it was really funny. Like, it, it didn't, it felt like such a limp, um, you know, attempt at at destroying something in anger that it made me feel like I couldn't even connect to the emotion of destroying something in anger. But, like, uh, like I tend to be extremely chill about almost everything because I just don't think it matters. It's like, being angry won't, will not resolve anything. It will not get me closer to a result. Um... It, in fact, will leave me in a headspace where it's more difficult to think of solutions because I'm too busy being angry, you know? And so, generally, I just try to get rid of anger as fast as possible. Like, and, like, I, you know, my, my methodology is usually to just, like, stop thinking about it immediately. Just to kind of put things out of mind and just be like, uh-uh, not dealing with it, you know? Um, which can be... Again, overly avoidant because sometimes I'm angry at a person and I don't really communicate that anger. And this is, you know, in my adult life, this has probably been the biggest cause of, of problems in relationships that I had in, in my, like, in my 20s was, like, me holding judgments or anger or, or just, like, you know, uh, or just, like, being confused about the actions of other people and not saying anything and them not assuming that I felt any way about it, you know, until a point where like my my uncomfortableness or my anger boils over and I and when I finally do say something, it's like I have this long list of all this stuff, like all these reasons, all this build up to like this thesis that I've been, you know, cultivating on why, you know, uh, why you behave wrongly. And it's like, okay, well, like where were you when all these things were happening? Like, why didn't you say anything at the time? And it's because, like, I don't know how. Like, I don't know how to confront people because, like, I don't want to make people feel bad. I don't want you to come away feeling like, oh, I've been a fuck-up or, like, oh, I have to reassess the things I've been doing. But, like, you know, people... I, I guess you have to, like, trust in people's desire to make themselves better and, like, you know, that that it's better for them for you to say something than for you to not because uh you know even if they don't like it like you know if they don't first of all if they don't like it i mean like you know you have to you can't be a dick about this right like it's it's one thing to just like be fucking calling people out all the time and pointing out every minute flaw but like if there's something that like you see as a persistent thing that this care this person does like it's not about like putting together an ultimate list and like you know hitting them with the scathing proof of the fact that they've been this way it's just kind of like hey man i noticed you uh do this thing like uh what's the deal with that you know like uh is there an explanation is there an understanding i need to come to that would maybe i can give you suggestions on how to do it differently you know like there's ways to be reasonable and not like hypercritical and it's difficult when you don't know how to, like, raise a point without seeming like you're complaining or without, like, you know, 
especially when you're trying to communicate quickly because you realize a lot of things really fast and so it's kind of like okay well i have to move through this and get through this and like get back to what i was already thinking about and keep track of all this different shit you know um so it's it's really about developing good habits right like uh in the first place like all right you have to shoot this guy in the mouth i think or maybe like there's some kind of weird way this boss works that i'm like not considering correctly yeah he's weak when he ever breathes the ice She actually, I think this is the like the, the mama she goth. If it's Metroid, it's most you know it's, it's safer to assume it's probably some kind of mother creature. Um, I feel like I answered that question already, but I'm in the middle of a boss fight. We'll just pause and we'll read the next one. Uh, actually, there's more to this comment. And just so this comment gets read, since I know how much you like these sorts of longer comments, I'd also like to ask you what you think about anger in art. As detailed above, I think there's more than one variety of anger, and they can be both useful in making art. Constructive anger is the punk kind, the kind of righteous indignation where someone tells you you can't do something that you aren't capable of, and you go, oh yeah, fuck you, watch me. Constructive anger is a motivator of action in a sense, right? And then destructive anger is the ugly kind where everything piles on and you can't do anything about it. It's the kind of anger that comes from pressure. And if you put enough pressure on anything, it'll crack eventually. So destructive anger is the violent, visceral anger, the kind that can really fuck someone if they aren't capable. What do you think about anger in art or anime, I guess, in stacks to your wheelhouse? Do you enjoy seeing it as in the attitude of the work itself rather than the individual characters? What are some of your favorite angry works of art? And what length of comment do you like to receive? Uh, any length is fine, but... um. Yeah, I love angry art. I love uh, any kind of, like, passionate, intense kind of thing. But I don't like angry, uh, dismissive, or, like, cynical art. Like, there's a lot of art where you can tell the author is angry at the world because he thinks, like, this is the way people are. Aren't people so shit? Like, I feel it that way about a lot of death game stories. They're just, like, very cynical about just the way reality is. And, like, that's fine and all, but, like... I'm interested in stories that are that are from people who clearly don't want the world to be this way or who think it can be better or who recognize that like this is not inherently a part of humanity it's just the flaws in the way that that people currently are you know and like that kind of like more understanding story so like you know you can be angry because shit is bad and you've been fucked and those are you know like you said righteous anger and like um Anger can be productive. It can be a, a good motivator, a good, like, uh, you know, it could be a good reason to, to, to spur the productivity. So, you know, I don't think anger is, like, a bad trait, but it does have to be managed. And, like, I am perhaps too good at anger management, too poor at displaying anger because of the fact that I tend to just, like, bury it and harbor it and then, like, let it become like this obsessive thing in the back of my mind where it's like I'm just like chronicling all the all the all the things this person has done that made me angry that I didn't say anything about because I couldn't justify it because I didn't want to have an argument you know um, and it's like well it, there's ways to raise you know issues without it having to be an argument by just you know being understanding in your approach to raising the issue I guess um, and that's what I've attempted to practice uh, at but yeah, I mean, uh, I can totally appreciate why someone else is angry, you know, like I can get behind their anger perhaps even more easily than I can, you know, get behind my own anger that I might feel more, uh, more guilty about, you know, um, I pause this and read another question. Shoto Studio says, This series has felt like a warm blanket for the mind, every question being a thought I've had in the past. But anyway, I think I've got a question that could be useful to the audience, too. If a creator were to get in hot water, pissing people off and shit, how can they keep it isolated to their online self? It's something that worries me sometimes. I don't want my family to have to pay for a mistake I made if I do something stupid. Do you just gotta go with the flow and face the shitstorm if it threatens your home? I can deal with making a mistake, but if I can set things straight, I'd feel terrible if they got harassed for my sins. Anyway, sorry for the late, long question. Keep up the good work, Digi. Um, so, I mean, it really depends on why you're in hot water. I mean, if you fucked up and you, th you know, you fucked up, uh, then you just have to apologize to 
whoever needs to be apologized to, you know, face whatever face whatever L you got to take and just take the L because that's the only way that people are going to not harass you about it, you know. But if it's something where you feel like you you don't deserve this hot water, like you are in the right um and like you know the only reason that you would back down is to protect the the people around you it really depends on your situation and and who you're trying to protect because for me like i would not be friends with somebody who would dis distance themselves from me over an opinion and so like i don't have the kinds of friends who will do that because i will not be friends with those people um I will not change what I'm going to say to make it easier for somebody. If that's something you can't deal with, then you just can't, you, you can't deal with me, you know? And like my overall mentality is more similar to Nate, uh, best guy ever, who his stance is like, there's no reason to start drama or offend anybody. So I'm not going to ever attempt to do that, you know? I, on the other hand, I do think there are reasons to start drama and offend people, but you have to have the right reasons. And I don't think I've always had the right reasons in the past. I think there have been times where I did, at times where it was even Im important for me to do certain things. But uh, maybe I didn't always, you know, necessarily do them the best way I could have. But, like, I do think that there are times when it's important to, you know, to raise a stink in a public kind of way. Um, but, like... In general, I am not out there to try to offend or hurt people, and I am not out there to, um, you know, to, to like, to, to, like, uh, to, to shit on anyone for being who they are or anything like that. So, like, if anything I say gets read that, like, that way, then it's, like, I can easily apologize for the fact that, like, I wasn't clear enough, I guess, but, like, I'm not going to apologize for the sentiment behind what I'm saying if I think that the sentiment is correct. And if somebody, you know, whether you agree with that sentiment or not, if you literally will not associate with me because I expressed a sentiment that I believe in, then I will not associate with you either. That's just, like, that's my baseline. And that's pretty much, like, the the baseline of, like, how all of, you know, my friendships are. Like, you know, even people who... I have friends who I disagree with on a lot of things, even some core things or things that, like, would embarrass their friends to know that I believe. But, like, as long as they are willing to put up with that, I'll put up with them, you know? Like, we both feel the same level of thinking the other person is wrong about this thing. But, like, obviously we don't think each other are bad uh, in general or that we're wrong about enough stuff to be, like, dismissed. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much my rule. Um, I don't think everybody is in a position where they can live their life that way. Um, I mean, I would encourage you to get into a position as best you can where you can live your life that way. I think you should strive to put yourself into a lifestyle where you're surrounded by people who accept you and will, uh, let you, you know, be true to yourself and your, uh, opinions. But, you know, if you are trying to say... You know, take care of your kids and just do your job. And you, there's certain times where you, you know, uh, your online self maybe, you know, fucks with that that livelihood. You just got to be careful. Like, don't become, don't don't put yourself in a position where it can affect your uh, offline self if that's something you're worried about. You know, F uh, figure out how to be. Just be safe is what I'm trying to say. You know. Um. Anyway. Next up, we have Good Gibbon, who says, Perma Lurker, stepping out with a couple cents. Mainly, I just want to say thanks for these videos. I only came out to myself about a month ago, and this series has been Im imperative in dismantling the last 23 years of delusions and falsehoods I've accumulated slash designed to explain why I can't be trans or should just get over it. The points you made about masks and being okay with being an ugly girl were especially necessary if deeply uncomfortable. Oh, believe me, it was not comfortable for me either to come to that realization. If I might ask, what's your perspective on restrictive treatment? I know in the mo UK, most doctors will flat out refuse to res prescribe hormones unless you pres uh, present to them as wanting to be the exact socially accepted version of the opposite sex. Do you see any validity in this approach? No. 
Uh, supposedly, it's about cost cutting and preventing self destructive detransitioning, which I know can be a deeply humiliating and asinizing situation for some people, but I can't help but see it as basically shunning people with less straightforward trans identities or less acceptable dysphoric experiences. I agree. This isn't so much for myself, as episode one already helped hugely with my understanding the less obvious feminine traits I identify with, but I'm still curious. Also, I don't know if you're at all interested slash have seen it, but Ollie Thorne has a pretty good video about more insidious, slow burning, and subtle types of trauma, men abuse trauma which is well worth a watch if you're interested. Thanks so much for all the advice you've shared over the years, and I hope things just keep getting better and better for you from here. Yeah, I definitely think that... I mean, I just don't want there to be any prescriptivism over gender or, or ho hormone use. Like, I mean, okay, why would hormone use even be restricted to people who wanted to transition to, like, a specific gender identity? Like, what if you wanted to stop in the middle? You know, like, what if you just wanted to... Uh, like, why is it any different from any other kind of medication or drug that we use? Like, you know, you can decide how high you want to get. You can decide how much caffeine you want to intake. You can decide, uh, you know, how much fucking uh, chemical brain-altering drugs you can ingest for, you know, other purposes. It's just like, I mean, I guess maybe the UK is more strict about some of those other things as well. I mean, here in the US, we've, uh, you know, we're slowly legalizing pot around the country and... Uh, and sort of pushing for, uh, you know, more transhumanism, and that's what I'm behind. So, like, I, that, which is essentially what I see hormone replacement as is, you know, just a a an early form of transhumanism that we are uh, that we're inventing. So, you know, uh, I say fucking absolutely, uh, absolutely, it should just be like, you know, I'm not saying that like people should just go willy nilly and fuck around because like, it's it comes down to knowing what you're doing, um, but like, people can figure out what they're doing other ways than uh, you know a doctor telling them what to do by having resources and having knowledge and like figuring shit out and experimenting and like having the strength of mind to deal with the consequences of the experiments you know um, it's not for everybody but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be legal it should just be well advised and educated on but that's how I feel about everything and good luck with that you know in this here world all right, uh, Paralyzed by Possibility, what a name. It says, Digi, I'm loving this series because it's making me realize more and more that I feel like you and I are basically just the same person with two major differences. One, I never moved around, which has, I think, contributed to a crippling anxiety associated with change that paralyzes me whenever I consider pivoting or giving things my all in a way that will matter to others. And two, my parents were like the opposite of yours in that they were very emotionally unavailable and could only be pleased when I did something socially laudable, resulting in me doubling down on the whole good grades for front and forcing myself to become the smart kid through scholastic performance and harness my hyperfocus. This ultimately led to me having a genetics degree I never planned to use and realizing now in my mid-twenties that I would have been better served learning to how to be creative as what I crave for my experience is being able to impart the emotions I feel in the heads of others via compelling narrative. What do you think is the best way for a very impressionistic lateral person who has spent their life forcing themselves to act lexically to break that shell and build the skills to create something they can be proud of i mean raw practice and commitment obviously but how do you start down that path when you find the concept of commitment paralyzing take the weight off of your shoulders and just do what other people think you should do based on what they want from you and by that what i mean is not just like do whatever anybody says but like within the realm of things you're interested in like let's say that you like, okay, first of all, figure out who are you trying to speak to? Like, who do you want your stories to be for? Do you want them to be for people who have similar experiences to you? Or do you want them to teach people who don't have similar experiences to you about your experience? Like, who do you want to reach? And then figure out what's the best way to reach them. How do you figure that out? A combination of looking at what they already like and also asking them what what is missing from what they already like. So, like, you know, for me, as a content creator, I've tried out all kinds of different stuff. It's very obvious to me what stuff people want from me based on view counts. But if I were to say, like, write a book and, and nobody in my audience liked it, then I would have to be like, okay, well, you guys are the same people that I'm trying to reach. What needs to change about this book? Like, what is it that you don't get? Or, like, you know, what kind of story... Like, Okay, I've noticed that you you uh you know 
that like all the all the people who watch my videos are also fans of you know this author like what is it about this author that it connects to to me that I can then rep replicate you know so it's just kind of like figure out like like figure out what you're trying to say like what do I want to communicate with my work who needs to hear that message how can I reach those people the best and like you know what skills do I have uh, that that can translate to reaching them you know in my case like my ability to communicate clearly and concisely um, even though it is the thing that I that was the most difficult thing for me to do because I obsessed over it until the point that I could do it it's now what I'm good at and like particularly I never understood who my videos were for until I made the neurotyping chart and I understood it because all the people who I related to the most and all the people in my discord um, who like who I saw as like the people who were sort of you know understood my content the best generally were the more impressionistic ones it was people more on the fascinator or new type categories and like those were the biggest like the overseer fascinator new type was the biggest um like result that people were getting in my audience and so i was kind of like okay that's really interesting and like i had thought of myself as a more lexical person but when i started talking to emotional thinkers i realized that a lot of them do not themselves worship emotional thinking they want to be lexical because they they see it as the fact that they can't explain themselves is their problem and when i realized that like lexical people are people to whom it's easy to communicate because they are staying within the realm of things that are identified um, like the like, well, I shouldn't say it's easy to communicate. It's dif their difficulty in communicating is that other people don't think that way. That like most people are more impressionistic um, than they are, but like the difficulty for impressionistic people is that you have a different impression from everyone around you, and that's where the lateral thinking starts coming in because in order for you to get on the same page as other people you have to flip back through the book until you find the page where you diverted from them in the first place and that's how you can come back and meet on an understanding you know so it's like you basically just need to figure out how can i peel back however many layers i need to get to to put myself on the same level of understanding as the people who are, are my audience you know and uh and so, like, for me, it's, like, my music might be the best way for me to express my mo emotions for me to understand them. And the people who think the most similarly to me will also understand those emotions without having them needing them to be explained any further. But are those the people who I'm trying to reach? Like, ultimately, I'm not just trying to communicate with people who already agree with me because those people, usually, I don't have to talk to that much. I, I really only need, like, the presence of one person like that in my life. Somebody who unconditionally loves me because they – and understands me and unconditionally loves that understanding, you know. Um, I have May for the understanding. I have, you know, my parents and brothers for the unconditional love uh, on top of the – you know, some degree of understanding. So, like, I'm pretty well spoken for in that regard. I obviously am getting something out of these interactions with all of you and, like, you know, being able to put things into words by answering questions helps me even further. But it's kind of like there's no sense of desperation in this. It's it's purely interest, intrigue. It's it's a desire to find even more, you know, to go even further. It's not out of like, oh, I need this for myself. It's like this is the best way to advance, you know. So like um, – I'm trying to think of how to – yeah, like so for me, the commitment is is less about uh, less about like um, less about like finding out like 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 having to figure out out of all these sea of possibilities like what do you want the most, and instead asking like what can you do the most, who can you do it for, how can you do it effectively, and then you know through that you will discover like you know your own 
your own take on it. Like, you'll discover what things you don't want to do for other people and what things you do enjoy doing for other people, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, that's probably the best advice I've ever given in my whole life. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, Komatov says, I don't really know exactly what I want, but I guess I want to ask is, how did you cope with your emotions before and after coming out, and did you find any healthy coping mechanisms? I'm retorting to slapping myself at the lowest and drawing out my better ones. Bawling my eyes out helps sometimes, but usually it irritates other people, and I'm never good with uh, exiting anxiety loops. I've had a lot of different things I've used to cope, and I would say that anime and art are the biggest thing, music, these are the biggest things, because like hearing something that sounds like how I feel you know, gives me that sense of kinship where it's like, okay, I'm not alone in these feelings. Like, Shinsei Kamate-chan was my favorite band from when I was, like, 19 to 21. And, like, their lyrics are songs where it's just, like, Noko screaming, I want to die, I don't want to die, I want to die, I won't want to die, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die. Or, I want to be a girl, I don't want to be a girl, or I want to be a boy, I'm not sure, I can't figure out which one I want to be. Like, these are literally, like, the lyrics of the songs, you know, um... And just, like, all the emotions that he was raging about were emotions I was raging about. So it's like, I did not feel alone in those emotions. I felt as though there is somebody trying to help me through them, even if it's just in the form of trying to help themselves through it, you know? Uh, and so that's, you know, literally what I try to be for other people. But I I also think that the the less you understand your own emotions, the, the more people you need to like reach it's like if you are somebody who feels like i don't get myself at all nobody around me can help i need like everybody in the world to pay attention to me until one of them can figure out what the fuck's going on you know and then you you ask yourself okay like cool i reached people like let me continue to do that but for me it's like reaching people as a famous person is extremely limiting in terms of like how well I can actually work with them or how well they can really understand me and my intentions. And it's like, I don't know, maybe if my work had been clearer from the start, I mean, like if I were to get famous now on the basis of being truer to myself, like if this were to lead to me becoming more famous than before, then I don't know that I would necessarily like balk at the opportunity to have more people kind of following me. But like, I like, having people I can work more closely with. Like, I like that the audience is just big enough that I can answer all of the questions that I'm interested in answering from these podcasts because, you know, like, it, it means that I feel like I am working with you and not just, like, it's not completely parasocial. There is an actual social element. We're actually having a conversation. You're not just watching my work and making assumptions about me and filling in the gaps. You, you know enough to know what I'm really about, you know, at this point. Um, I've, I've insisted that wasn't the case many times before, but it is the case now. You do know enough about me to know what I'm really about um, at this point. So, uh, yeah, so I would say relating to other things, relating to people, relating to art, talking to people who also connect with the things I'm experiencing, these are all important, um, you know, and, and, uh, Finding ways to express it yourself, you know, like creating art, creating, uh, you know, like the, the, the author of Stop Hibari Kun, um, you know, which you've seen in all the thumbnails of these episodes, is uh, he draws girls because he wishes he was born a girl. They wish they were born a girl. I don't, I don't, you know, it's weird with Japanese because they don't have like gendered pronouns naturally. And I think that's like, in, in a in a bizarre way, um, like, all the Japanese, like, trans terms are, like, they mean the same thing, but, like, 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 they are understood emotionally the same way, but because of, again, the fact that, like, the Japanese language and culture is, like, like, repression and bifurcation is not seen as, like, an odd thing or, like, difficult to understand, you know? So it's, like, this idea of like, oh yeah, I am a, I feel like a woman, but I am a boy, like, is is a sentiment that they could have that doesn't translate as much in America, where it's like you just have to be the thing, you know, um, 
And I don't know which mentality is better. I feel like you need to be somewhere in the middle of the two because really what what the ultimate way of living is to be adaptive and, uh, you know, react to the environment and the necessities therein. So, um, you know, you should put yourself into environments where you can express yourself as openly as possible for your own mental health. But, um, you know, you should also stay safe and understand the world as it is and not as you wish it to be, even as you try to bring it closer, try to, you know, close that gap. All right, Shinigami Soul says, I agree with your take, as I understand it, of everyone wanting to feel satisfied emotionally, but I think there's people that the satisfaction comes in the expense of others, and they deliberately manipulate so they can get that. I don't know if talking with these can change anything to them if they are not coming from a reasonable place emotionally. Emotionally, you can't convince a sociopath that killing people is something that he should not do in principle, for example, and that person can convince others just with rhetoric and things that they want to listen. One thing I want to see all the time is people who use arguments to justify why they think the way they do, and when you show that all their arguments are bullshit, you realize that they were just picking arguments that are consistently enough in their heads to justify how they are feeling and reduce cognitive dissonance or even deceive people and not really being rational or empathetic or empathic. My point is that if you really care about people, you shouldn't be neutral about these kinds of content creators expressing themselves so we can understand them because a lot of the times if we take what they say at face value, we're just being fooled and you can ha only have a vague understanding of them if you know how to read between the lines or enough of the subject that's being discussed already. Also, obligatory destiny is not a leftist comment. It seemed like you implied so. Uh, true, but how to see non-cynically. Okay. Um, so in order to see that non-cynically, uh, you just need to understand that like you you're you have to read through the lines like you have to task yourself to always be reading through the lines because everybody has an incentive to lie to you like whether you trust people or not everybody has an incentive to lie to you and they probably will where they feel they can like everybody has their own lines of morality of what lies they think are acceptable or not obviously i thought it was an acceptable level of presentation of self to you know like to to obfuscate my feelings in certain ways, you know? Um, so, like, or, or even just to be selective. Like, there, uh, there was somebody who sent me a comment that uh, was, was, like, analyzing deeper into, like, something that I had said on one of these shows in a way where they were, like, peeling apart what I didn't say in addition, like, and how, like, what, how that said more about the way I had framed a statement than what I said. And, um, you know, ultimately it came down to that, like, I'm trying to protect somebody else by not going into depth about my feelings on, like, you know, on, on that particular subject that, that they had brought up. So it's like, yeah, you know, you're right. You're reading between the lines is correct. Um, but, you know, I cannot present everything that I'm feeling necessarily if like I think it's more important to present those feelings in a in a different context where they will uh you know where like I can be sure that they will be effective you know like so you know yeah it's it's like not always a good idea to necessarily just like say absolutely everything exactly as it happens but it's like you have to expect that everyone is being dishonest on some level, but do you understand their intentions? Like, do you get that they are being dishonest for reasons that you can accept? Or do you think they're being dishonest to deceive you into, you know, believing something other than what they're trying to say? Or even if you do, do you feel confident that you understand what they're really trying to say and therefore you can predict their actions accordingly? You know, that like... You can trust them insofar as you know what they're really trying to do. And so, you know, you you trust them to act in accordance with those actions or with those intentions, regardless of how they actually behave. You know, um, I think we all navigate each of these forms of trust, you know, all the time uh, in, in dealing with people. But uh, I'm realizing I went the wrong direction again. Uh, yeah, like. I guess I just think that, like, you know, you need to 
understand that everybody is trying to satisfy themselves emotionally at the cost of others and do not let them take anything from you, you know? Like, navigate the interaction in such a way where the only things you give are things you want to give and where you are suspicious of intentions. Um, but ultimately be willing to trust when there is evidence that you should. And like, if you think that you are not good at trusting the right people, then, you know, like, it's just a matter of like figuring out what you fall for. Like, what are the things that, that you tend to get fooled by, you know, and then don't let yourself get, won't get fooled again, you know, like just figure out how to, um, how to surround yourself with the kinds of people that will be beneficial to you or that you do trust or that you don't think are trying to fuck you over. And, uh, and like, you know, have faith in those people and their intentions, even if they turn out to be wrong sometimes, or even if you think like, you know, they don't understand themselves as well as they could, or that they, they don't treat you the way that you, you know, you wish they would, but it's like, you know, as long as it's within like an acceptable, level of like you still think that this person is trying and that they are helpful and that like it's more of a benefit than a detriment to be around them you know i I basically view everything in terms of cost benefit analysis so i think that's the most effective way to live it's just like you know is this person more of a benefit than a detriment to listen to and to trust if so trust them um you know, you don't have to trust absolutely everything everybody does, but like, you know, don't assume that they're trying to fuck with you if there's no evidence and listening to them has helped you in the past. Uh, Opez29 says, do you think you are denying some masculine traits and that's why your feminine side is being expressed more? If so, do you see this as a problem? My intuition says we should work to incorporate both aspects of our personality. I have seen a lot of media fans, especially anime fans, become trans as of late. And it is definitely an interesting trend. Being trans seems very different because difficult because of the alienation you always feel within the self. Uh, never being fully able to come become a woman in the sex sense. Your expectation never fully meeting reality. I am not trans, but the suicide rate among trans is definitely suggests that trans people are feeling some kind of alienation. I mean, absolutely. Everything you just said is uh, 100% accurate. Um, and it's, it's, it's really sort of, in my mind, kind of like gratifying to... to th- I, I guess the reason that I'm somewhat defensive of... Um, the idea of the social norms is that like really it is like realizing how girly my like my taste actually is like how much i actually do fit the stereotype of a girl makes it a lot easier for me to identify myself as trans because if i'm a guy who acts this way then i don't really understand why you know um and and so like i think that there's a lot of things that i repressed like, I don't think I ever repressed anything masculine. I've only ever repressed femininity. And, like, for for me growing up, I would say I wasn't really repressing anything at all. I was just expressing myself, being told that I was effeminate, and then distancing myself from people because I didn't understand why they felt that way, you know? And, like, so, you know, the like, any time people told me that, like, something you are doing you know, is effeminate, that's, like, what girls do, or that's gay, then that's, like, a a behavior that it's, like, I'm gonna become self-conscious about. Unless I disagree, you know? Like, if I think, oh, that's not effeminate, that's not gay, then I'll be defensive. But if I do think that this behavior is effeminate or gay, and I don't want to be those things, which I did not when I was, you know, younger, then I need to avoid behaving that way. And... When I finally did, you know, as a, as a teen, like, realize that I wanted to be a girl, then, like, I started incorporating a lot of, like, uh, you know, like, like, basically embracing being more effeminate the way that I really felt, but it was usually not met with enthusiasm by the people close to me. Like, you know, being true to myself is being annoying. Like, I am annoying. My, my, the, my natural way of acting is to be, you know emotional and sing-songy and and referential and barely comprehensible you know to most people and uh you know i don't expect somebody to to like embrace everything about me even just accepting it even just being okay with it or not you know not like 
aggressively being mad that like I'm trying to just like express myself and like have fun. You know, like the fact that like me having fun is something that I get put down for, I guess is like is what caused me to like, you know, reject those elements of myself. And I think that the reason that people found those things annoying about me is that they are you know, they're they're traits that like guys don't try to embrace in themselves. Like you know, breaking out into song all the time or like being embarrassing, being emotional, you know, like being overly sincere, being overly kind of serious when you talk and, and not, you know, not just like passively taking jabs and nut checking at each other, you know, like, which is a type of interaction that doesn't interest me. But like when I uh, discovered Dick Masterson, he helped me a lot to understand the benefits of masculine thinking, of being aggressive, of being competitive, of like, uh, of taking the attitude of like, fuck what other people think, you know, um, I'm going to do whatever I want. And even though like, I had that attitude on the internet, because it's easy for me to separate my mental and physical selves because of the fact that I don't feel at home in my body so i don't like relate to my body and so i feel weird about like being acknowledged physically it's like i would prefer that like you only acknowledge my thinking and my ideas and like you know and and who i am as a person because if you recognize me for what i look like then you're not recognizing how i feel you know but like i think i discovered that that maleness could be a defense mechanism. It could be like this suit of armor that Samus is wearing, you know, where like I can, I can, you know, use the, use the, those properties that, that people are expecting from me and, and actually lean into them and it will help me. And like, that's ultimately what like feminism and being a strong woman is also about is learning the survival skills to not need to rely on men to do those kinds of things for you. And like, I relied so heavily on my parents throughout my life that like, uh, you know, um, I never learned how to do things by myself and I never learned the mentality that I had to have to approach doing things by myself. And like, you know, uh, again, I was somebody who literally was like waiting for a knight in shining armor to come and save me when I was growing up. Like, uh, and you know, when I realized that like I had to be that for myself, then that's when I like embraced more of my masculine side. Again, th this is the same thing as like a, a girl doing the same, um, realizing, oh, I have to toughen up to deal with the world, you know? Uh, but like, ultimately, that is not where my comfort zone is. Like, I don't want to be the, the person who is dedicated to being as tough as possible so that I can survive in this world. Like, you know, ultimately, you need to understand how bleak the world is and can be so that you can survive in scenarios that you will be thrust into. But if you are not being forced to live in that scenario, if you are not like if if your life is not putting you in a position where you have to toughen up, then that is not the ideal way to live for anybody. And I think that like, you know, to me, the masculine ideal is a man who feels comfortable enough in himself and in the world around him that he, you know, can be emotional, can express himself. Um, but like, ultimately, where his pride comes from is in the things that he does, the things that he's accomplishing. And I think that, you know, as I said before, like, for a man, it's more about like, you know, this is what I do and I do it the best. And I think for a woman, it's like, this is who I am and I do it the best, you know? And, uh, and not to say that the, again, they can't cross the streams, but like, you know, maybe it's better to say emotional thinking versus, uh, versus lexical thinking even, but those, you know, the reason those tend to arise more in one of the other uh, gender has to do with the hormones that exist. And I also think it's important to, emphasize i think i i know i talked about this in some kind of video but i don't know if it's out yet um that like your body literally like the way that hormone replacement works is like your body tells itself to be male or female based on 
what it thinks it is supposed to do. Like the hormone production comes as a result of, you know, your your body being told to secrete male hormones and or being told to secrete whatever, you know, whatever hormones are necessary to accomplish, I guess, the goal that that you're trying to reach, you know, like whatever your comfort zone is. So, like, I think that people underestimate how much like literally putting yourself in the mind state of like I I want to be a more emotional thinker. I value my emotions. So my body is going to release more, uh, you know, estrogen, like, uh, more, more of a hormone that will, that will make me emotional so that I can capitalize on the benefits of that, you know, or vice versa. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, whether it's literally like going to alter your hormone release or not to think differently it certainly will change the way that you it'll change your habits it'll change your approach and you'll find yourself you know working towards trying to be the type of person that you're trying to be and when i was uh, a kid and a teen i was not trying to be a guy i was trying to be like my mom i just wanted to be recognized as a boy because i biologically was one and considered it incorrect to be you know recognized as a woman but like in the effort of trying to be like a mom i think you know like the most beneficial form i could take would be a female form you know like I don't gain much from from having masculinity. Like I, I gain from understanding masculinity, from being able to utilize it, from you know uh, having the ability to tap into you know whatever energy that is. But like <coughs> it doesn't benefit me necessarily to have it as like a you know as like a a, a main feature of my uh, the content of my person i i suppose oh god i was really confused about the fuck i had to do in that room um yeah uh so anyway oh i also had a note in here uh with regards to that question that uh i wanted to talk about hibari from stop hibari kun a little bit because like hibari is the the author you know said that himself that he you know based on the desire to be have been born a girl hibari was created and that you know a lavish amount of effort was put into making hibari like as just like beautiful and perfect as possible like this is the vision of what this author wished they had done as a child and like i connected with that element of the show immediately once I understood, like, okay, when I watched Hibari Kun when I was younger, because uh, I, I saw the first episode back in 2009, it was the only episode that was subbed, I was super excited about the show because at the time, I was super into what I called traps because that's how I understood them, that's the terms that they used. I literally was in love with them and the concept and that's all I cared about it was like, boys who dress as girls, that's what I'm about because that's what I wanted to be. And I didn't have, you know, terms like trans or this idea of, you know, oh, that person is a girl. I thought of it as like, that is a boy dressing as a girl because that's what they want to do. And the, I, you know, basically mistook the playfulness of Hibari as like, okay, so like Hibari wants, is in love with the main character and wants to date him. But like, I think that for people who are, the reason that the term trap kind of exists is that for people who are emotionally insecure about like being liked by someone it, it does kind of feel like a trap i mean there's a lot of men who consider marriage a trap who consider women in general a trap it is a a trap to get you to emotionally care about somebody um through the basis of your desire to have sex with them um you know so that they will trap you into a relationship in that sense hibari is a trap but the trap is not that, you know, she's trying to trick someone into falling in love with a boy. She's trying to trick someone into falling in love with a girl. You know, Hibari sees herself as a girl. She approaches everything as a woman. It's not like she's going to change it up once she's got him in the sack and suddenly be uh, act as a man and, you know, 
fucking do whatever he's afraid is going to happen. Like, you know, she's performing as a woman because she sees herself as a woman and is in love with a man as a woman and is behaving out of the attempt to make that happen. And like when I watched the show and I was younger, like that flirtatiousness, I did not understand that Hibari literally likes this guy. Like to me, flirtatiousness always came off as trying to fuck with someone. And it's only like once I became an adult that I could recognize who all had been flirting with me throughout my past. And it's funny because uh, like there are several like lesbians or bisexual girls who like were the ones who talked to me the most and who in retrospect I see as having flirt were flirting with me were trying to indicate to me that like they recognize like that they're into the femininity that I display but I didn't understand that you know like I just could never imagine what somebody found appealing about me. Um, until I recognized myself as a woman and I was like, oh, well, like people like that I'm a woman, like people like that I'm effeminate, that I'm sensitive, that I'm emotional, that I can explain emotions well, that I can connect with them emotionally. Like that's what people want from me is the, is the emotional femininity. And that's why all the girls I like are, you know, are butch and often closeted lesbians. And that's why, you know, um... That's why my audience is full of trans people and like, you know, it's, it's just, it's just kind of like the domino effect of realizing that everything does make sense. You just have to understand the way in which it makes sense, you know? And, uh, like I, I look at Hibari Kun as like, this is what I would have been if I had just embraced it. Like if people had told me you are a girl, um, we like you as a girl, then Hibari is the type of girl I would have tried to be. And, like, the show it just fills me with this immense sense of hope for myself that, like, even if I can't be, like, super cute and attractive and, like, like Hibari, Hibari is, is uh, one of the interesting things about the show is that, like, her love for the main character is kind of um, reining her in because, like, Hibari is kind of manipulative and has, like, all these people around her finger and, like, you know, like, will literally the, – in the first episode, there's a part where somebody asks her out and she's like, how much will you pay me? You know, like, some cakes to kill a shit right there. Like, straight up, like, she is out for attention. She's out for somebody to, to, to love her and recognize her for who she is. But everybody's just obsessed with her. They just, like – because she's so beautiful, they all want to be with her. Um, like, and, and but none of them know that she, you know, is assigned male at birth. Well, the main character is still attracted to her in spite of this knowledge, in spite of himself. He constantly is uh, mad at himself and second guessing, but he continues to be attracted to Hibari. He continues to let her string him along, even though he has this knowledge. And so Hibari is like, okay, well, this is my guy. Like, so. Like, even though in the very start of the show, she's very flirtatious and she still uses flirtatiousness as sort of a, a, a negotiating tactic, ultimately, she wants to be with this person, you know? And uh, and that, that interests me a lot because, like, I was never... I never had any element of flirtatiousness or promiscuousness in my upbringing because I was terrified of sex. Like, even though... I got into – I discovered, like, my dad's porn when I was, like, eight maybe, eight or nine. And I would look at it and, like, just kind of, like, grind my crotch against the ground and look at this porn. And, like, even then I preferred, like, stuff where it was, like, just – like, not necessarily sex but just, like, girls or just, like, lesbians, like, you know, together – I have very strong, like, memory of the first time I ever saw two girls with a double-sided dildo and was like, whoa, this is possible? Like, I didn't know it could be this way, you know? Um, but, like, you know, I wasn't trying to come at the time. Like, I wasn't masturbating to achieve orgasm. I was just, like, grinding against the floor and looking at pictures of girls. Like, 
So, like, I don't know. Was that an expression of, like, gender dysphoria? Like, was that an expression of my wanting to be those girls and, like, trying to find a way to connect to the feminine experience physically? Maybe so, because it was very confusing once I finally did go through puberty and, like, you know, and masturbation took on a different form. And then it became... Uh, a, a confusing jumble of like you know the desire to have sex and to be a woman you know and like I think that confusion and like my sort of not understanding what uh, you know what was the difference um, you know was always a source of contention in my own mind and life maybe I needed to like shoot a missile at that thing over there I cannot figure out the fuck I have to do here this room is confusing Um, so yeah, like, oh, there's more to this, uh, okay, I guess I'm done talking about that. Yeah, I'm going to read this next comment. It says, this podcast really put the pieces together for the lyric, lucky I have a mother and a girl who's going to be another. When I started getting really into your videos, I did a semi-deep dive of your blog, including going into the internet archive and looking at what your favorites page used to be before it was redirected to the 2014 video. The biggest thing that stood out were your Ava post and the comments on your Adolescence of Utena post. Not going to recount anything, just that they introduced me to your struggle with identity. That someone whose analyses I related so much to had gone through emotions relatively similar to my own really drew me further into your content. Like, if I followed you, I would understand why I was questioning my gender. It was just one of the many ways that I kind of see you as my way, uh, a way my life could have gone, at least if I had your level of writing skill and discipline. When you came out, one of your fans tweeted that you previously uh, gave closeted trans people hope that transition was not the only option. I think my feelings were the opposite. Anytime I saw you kind of embrace maleness and accept that male character as you were, I was more afraid, uh, more afraid than anything else. Of course, I am not you. Being comfortable in my skin is not something to fear, and the fear is probably a clue that I should do something with my identity, even if it doesn't stick or help. Now that you're out, I feel irrationally validated. I also feel left behind. Uh, feel left behind and like anything I've done to come out has not been enough, but it's not a race. Excited to hear more of these. I mean, I understand that feeling because like I legit was not going to come out. Like I said before, until I had like, until I like looked the way I wanted to look on some level, like not that I felt I had to look like perfect, but that I had to look, I guess, quote unquote, enough like a woman that like people would think I was serious, I guess. And, like, I really had to put those feelings behind me because it's, like, that's not what matters. Like, what this is not about, um, you know, this isn't about, like, it's not about doing it perfectly. It's about not being, like, misunderstood and depressed anymore, you know? It's, like, I need to come out. It's imperative. Like, I won't be able to communicate with people. Like, the confusion over why I am silent or why I... You know, like, what's going on with me is only going to get worse if I can't explain something to people. And, like, even if it's an imperfect explanation, I could just keep explaining. That's kind of what I was saying earlier to that other guy who said, like, uh, you know, I shouldn't always – I always say guy because, you know, in my mind I just always assume everything's a guy, which is a bad habit, probably born out of this particular projection. But, um, you know, that other person had said, uh, like – how do you um shit i literally lost track of what i was gonna say well you probably get it i'm sure i don't need to reconnect this thread i think it was obvious what i was trying to say but yeah um i too find it a relief like i don't i i never viewed myself as somebody who was trying to become a man like I, I think other people projected some of that onto me because of the fact that i was using more of a masculine identity that they thought i was like um, you know, like, okay, going in that direction. I didn't look at it as like, oh, I am building myself away from a feminine identity. I looked at it as I am building myself towards a comfort zone where I will be able to express my feminine identity eventually. I just had not reached it. And like, again, this is a matter of like, realizing, okay, you cannot wait until the day everything's perfect to start trying to sort your feelings out. And in fact, it will probably go quicker if you let other people help you. Like, you know, who's going to who's going to know more about what you're going through than other trans people who won't be able to help you if you're if they don't realize you're trans. And like I was always waiting for somebody to like figure it out. Like I said about the unknown tape, it's like and not that that album is like a cry out to specifically about like transness or anything, but um just like 
But these guys are not the yellow ones that I can only shoot with the yellow gun. I didn't even realize. Um, yeah, like, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that I was, like, waiting for somebody to just kind of, like, decode it and then, like then I would feel like I could come out. I don't know, it's so ridiculous, especially since, like, there already are people who have decoded it. You know, like, May decoded it. Is is she the only one who gets to experience my emotion? Like, am I only going to show emotions to people who have decoded my music? Is that, like, the limiting factor, I guess, is, you know, the question you, I had to ask myself to, to get over myself. This seems massive, this bagel sandwich that I have received. Um, I was not anticipating that. All right, I gotta wrap up this fucking episode. I only have a couple more questions, uh, so that I can fucking um, eat this food I got. All right, the next one's from Aldorn, who says, "Hey, Digi, I gotta say that as happy as I am for you, and as much as all of this seems to be helping you and others, I sort of feel sometimes like I have the exact opposite problem. Like I'm horrifically bad at repressing myself. Normally, this is a good thing because who would want to be repressed, right? But couple it with some amount of paranoia and a generally very lexical way of thinking, and I find myself constantly in a state of questioning myself. Like I'll be thinking I have a good idea of who I am and what I should be doing, but then I find myself asking the same questions over and over again. This is, this is like." This is how I actually think is what you're describing. This is like what I'm moving back in the direction of in a way, but I'll, I'll get to that. This is a particularly bad thing when it comes to moral dilemmas. Say that I come across a situation where I could hypothetically get involved and possibly change things for the better. I analyze the situation, think it through, and come to the conclusion that I shouldn't get involved because I'm not qualified to or don't want to or I don't have enough information, etc. But then I just can't stop thinking about it. Did I really make the right choice? Should I get involved anyway because there's a chance I could have helped? I would say yes. I think that you are... Again, when you make assumptions about a situation, you fail to acknowledge how that situation can evolve and change. And even just injecting yourself into a situation gives a whole ton of evolutionary potentials for it. Like, it might be that somebody won't even they, – they might change their whole thinking around the fact that you are involving yourself. You know, like their understanding of how things – like what their situation is might be different if they think that somebody is trying to assist them, you know? Um, and it also might give them strength to, to like think of their approach differently or realize something. I've had people where like literally, or, and this is something I do myself where like, I will like start to ask somebody a question and in the process of forcing myself to ask a question, realize the answer, you know, like it's, it's just as simple as like, the more possibilities there are for how somebody can get out of a situation, the, you know, the more imagination they will have in their ability to do so. So, like, even if your information doesn't – like, isn't accurate or isn't perfect, as long as you present it that way, you know, just say, like, hey, I'm not an expert, but here's what I think based on the knowledge I have. And, like, they're going to take – they're going to do with that what they want. They're not going to just take your advice at face value, especially if they don't trust you or if you don't present it in a way they understand. They're just going to blow it off, you know, and maybe that's a waste of everyone's time, but at least you tried and at least it won't be on your consciousness. And if they fuck up even after you told them what to do, then, well, fuck them, you know. Um, so, yeah, like, I, I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, be confident in the idea that there are people waiting to hear from you, even if it's not the perfect thing to say you know they need to hear something because it's possible nobody's saying anything and you should always you know be more worried that they are not going to get anyone's help than that they're going to get bad help from you i guess is the way i would put it uh there's more to this it says and in, when it comes to matters of self-identity uh this is the same issue applies i'll question whether or not i feel slash should feel a certain way about things come to a conclusion and then for some reason be unable to stop thinking about it it's possible that this is because deep down i really am the ways that i worry thing uh i could be but i find this unlikely considering the extremity and variety of things that's happened with over the years well you just got to think of those as, as metaphors and it's funny that you say you're a very lexical thinker because it seems like you're more like me where you're a very impressionistic thinker who tasks themselves to justify things lexically and is therefore confused all the time because you understand things emotionally, you just second guess them because you don't have a lexical explanation um, that makes the most sense. You can't decide which of these explanations is best because you have a bunch of things that, that seem equally possible to you. The question is, is there any real reason 
Like, is there any evidence to suggest that those things are true? Like, just because they could be true, is there actually evidence to suggest that they are true? And if not, then can you put yourself into the position of thinking that, okay, maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. What, like, um, you know, which one, which belief will be the one that, that helps me out of the situation I'm in or that, like, gives me something to act on, you know? Um... Or which one do I think is more likely? Like, act on the act on the one that you ultimately want to be true, I guess, uh, and, and see where that gets you. But, like, uh, again, the best way to figure out if you're wrong about something is to ask somebody else. Just assume that it's, it's not that you think they're going to be correct. Again, you know, treat it the same way as what I said you should do to others. Uh, assume that even if they are wrong, they might be right in some way deep down you know there might be some element some metaphorical way uh that you can look at what they're saying and understand and appreciate it and i really think that like you know i said this on twitter recently everybody thinks in metaphors inherently but nobody tries to think in metaphors like everybody tries to come up with a justification because they don't want to seem crazy or they don't want to seem stupid but like your feelings are based on something just because you can't explain what they're based on doesn't mean they're not based on something it could be that, you know, what they're based on is like if if you take an action, um, on the basis of 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 something that you don't comprehend why you're feeling it, the action could be incorrect, but it doesn't make the feelings incorrect. You just have to understand the feelings. So it's about, you know, finding people who have similar feelings, comparing notes, uh, you know, looking into the information that does exist on the subject, and trying to see if something. You know, if you can get to the bottom of why this feeling is there, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's my advice. I also wrote uh, developing instincts via personality. So, yeah, like, I, I think that I've, I've talked before about how I think everybody's goal is to live as close to their instincts, as close to their emotions as possible. But this is only something you can do successfully if you have good instincts. And good instincts are really dependent on the time and place that you're in. Like, there are some people who have great instincts for certain things, terrible instincts for other things. Um, but, like, you know, if you, you have to figure out, like, what, like, when... I follow my instincts in this category. Does it tend to lead to success or failure? If it tends to lead to failure and it's something I really want to do that I really want to task myself to do, figure out what I'm doing wrong and fix it. If it's something I don't really care about doing, I just feel like I have to and I'm not good at it, don't task yourself to do that. Find something else that when you, you know, when you do it, it, it does lead to positive results uh, and like pursue more like that, I guess. All right, there's only a few more questions here. We've got Wraith who says, I'm a straight white male, so I honestly don't understand this, and I'm not a troll slash flaming you, genuinely asking for clarification so I can understand what you're talking about. How is this impacting your marriage? Is your wife okay with becoming a woman? you becoming a woman? How far do you plan to take this? Because you mentioned trans surgery basically leaves you with much less enjoyable and perhaps visually unappealing sex organs. If your wife is on board with you becoming a woman and you say you are bisexual, will you pursue a relationship with a man or men? And is your wife also okay with that? If not, it's a struggle to deny that part of your sexuality for the rest of your marriage. Um, you know, I, uh, I would say that, as I described earlier, I think I am more bisexual than I thought, but mostly in the sense that my sexuality is more emotional. That, like, I mean, to me, like, I'm, I'm definitely more attracted to women in the sense that I'm more likely to see a woman and think, oh, wow, that's a hot girl. Like, I don't feel that way about guys. I don't see guys and think, oh, that's a hot guy. Like, very rarely and usually because they're effeminate. You know, like, like, uh, like Yuri, uh, the, the Russian Yuri from Yuri on Ice. Like, you know, that's a boy who is beautiful in all the ways that I want a girl to be beautiful, you know? Um, but the more that I find the femininity within myself and the beauty within myself, the less I need for the people that I'm in love with to be beautiful, like to be attracted to their beauty as opposed to other elements of them, of their personality, you know? And like, I've always loved May, not just because she like, you know, she got my attention by being attractive, uh, but like the reason I was interested in her was that she liked my music and liked similar like you know anime to me and like the same kind of beer as I did and like similar characters to me, and you know 
like the stuff that she liked that I liked was stuff that had a lot of meaning to me, like stuff that I considered to be deeply indicative of who I was as a person. And so like, you know, it meant a lot that like, these were the things we were connecting over. Um, even if, even if we were just like Snapchatting and not really having like an actual like conversation, you know, like I still felt like a kind of deep bond in like the type of sexuality we express towards each other, like our approach towards what we wanted, like from sexuality. And like, I think that, you know, now that we are both like recognizing ourselves for like the parts of ourselves that we had closeted and like the projections we were making towards one another, um, you know, we're both a lot happier in our relationship. And like, Honestly, like the way like our sexual experiences have been evolving in a way where it's like we understand the other person's needs even better. And like I really do think that like m like because ever since I started behaving as a woman, pretty much like from the very beginning of me deciding that I was going to be like out to myself, May has been very insistent that she likes me more this way, that like she's more attracted to me. She thinks I'm more like uh, just like more pleasant more i'm obviously happier with myself it's like all the things she likes about me are things that are at the forefront and like the more you know the parts of my personality that maybe you know like not to say that nothing about this version of me is annoying because uh i think that may is somebody who always hung out with guys and really struggled to connect with girls because she struggles to relate to that like to the like the aggressive emotionality towards the things that she says, you know, like, like that, that kind of like, I don't understand why you're getting upset, you know? And that's kind of how I felt about guys all growing up. It's like, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess I felt that way towards girls as well. And that's why I was afraid of them is because I was like afraid of hurting them that like, they are so easily hurt that like, it's, it's scary to try to interact with them. And, uh, and like, I, you know, regardless of feeling like a girl, feel like a very surly girl because I was raised by very surly parents who, you know, who are rough around the edges and swear a lot. So, like, you know, I understand why, uh, why, like, communication with girls was more difficult for me when I was younger. But, like, when I got to high school or when I got on the internet, girls have always been way easier to talk to because they're not uh, aggressive and they don't give me a reason to have to be regret aggressive in return. They're, they're not insulting me, thus causing me to feel the need to insult them back, you know? Um, uh, so like, you know, it, it's like, I could just have these kinds of like mellow, you know, not trying to be funny, not trying to project anything, just like, you know, being very sincere. Like that's more my comfort zone. So, uh, so yeah, like I think that for May, like th there is some difficulty in that like I think that she's always been attracted to girls but always had difficulty communicating with them because even though she is one, she doesn't get why they have the reactions or feelings that they do some of the time. And that like for me as somebody who's like just so used to like being misunderstood because, you know, people don't treat me as a girl. People don't expect me to have those emotions that I have. Um, I'm used to just locking them down and just dealing with that lack of understanding, even as I am capable of understanding, you know, like, girls' behavior. And, like, I've always been able to understand May's emotional side that, like, she kind of fears and hates about herself, the, like, that side that is, like, the paranoid emotional like overreactive kind of side that she like looks to me as like my advice in my ability to help her to like set that aside whereas i look to her for her ability to like help me to let that side out you know um and i think that's mostly what men and women are looking for in each other is like women are looking for a more uh, a man who can be more rational and uh, you know if they are themselves more emotional and somebody who's more emotional is looking for somebody who can be more rational i shouldn't have said women and men because this is just like you know in general but like um that is the stereotype you know and like in our case we thought we were just living up to the stereotype in this regard like i thought it was like oh you know that's what we're looking for in each other but like in reality again like it's not either of our comfort zone like may doesn't want to be the emotional one she wants help being the rational one and she's better at doing that because she is motivated by 
the decisions being like something that has like a clear goal and progression and like there's a meaning behind me taking this action and like I'm accomplishing something and like for me it's more about like understanding it's 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 not about like it's not about getting things done it's about understanding why people are doing things and how to get them to do the right things you know so like i guess that's the that's where i see that like you know what we're going for in our role is what the like what we see the other person as helping us to do and the more that we stop trying to like do it for the other person but instead encourage them to do it for us i feel like i've made this point several times but i'm like this is like something i'm newly thinking about anytime you hear me repeat the same idea like five times over the course of a podcast it's probably because it's like a conversation i had beforehand or like something i've been thinking about a lot and like trying to put into words myself um, whereas, like, stuff that I just kind of say when I, like, have some fucking huge sage-like aphorism where I just, like, drop the exact point in one perfectly phrased sentence probably means I've been thinking about it for more than just recently. Um, but, you know. Um, gotta fight these fucking space pirates before I read the next question. Get fucked, cock. Alright, um, so... Ale asks, uh... Do you wish you could project less and less, uh, project less and feel more the sexual experience of a woman? For me, it was like I was always more attracted to intimacy and cutesy stuff, but my body wouldn't let me get the same gratification out of it as I would from visual tits and ass type stimulation. As if my instincts wanted me to play the male role, but my mind wanted me to play the female role. It's almost like Davout's explanation of physical versus mental attraction. I, you know what? I think uh, I, that basically plays into what I was just talking about. That like. Um, I was always fixated on, like, the beauty of women. That, like, I wanted to be with a very attractive woman. That, like, I wanted to have, like, hot sex, you know? And even when I started having it, like, I had a lot of jealousy towards the fact that May got to have, like, more sexual experiences than I did. And I, I, I never really got to have many because, like, I never felt like I got to understand myself fully sexually because of the limited number of experiences that I had, but I also did not want to have more. Like, I don't really, I don't see myself as somebody who, like, really gets that much out of having sex as much as the intimacy involved with having sex. Like, the opportunity to be, you know, deeply intimate with a person is, like, what I want. And so, like, it's really the emotions that I'm connecting with. And I don't think I understood that because I couldn't figure out, like, what is missing from my sexual encounters until I started trying to reverse my, my role, you know? And like, I did have some curiosity myself over like, am I going to like, am I going to feel like if I don't get some kind of like male attention as well, like, is it, it will I, will it feel incomplete? But in reality, like the type of like, I, I, you know, I guess the reason I have so much faith in May in the first place is that she was already able to provide that for me when I did need it, you know, like, like my trust in her is born out of the fact that at times when my strength faded uh she was able to be stronger than me you know and i've always kind of had that in the back of my mind as like may thinks that she that that like you know i guess just because two people need each other um or or might need each other like one of you might need the other person more in this particular moment is not necessarily necessarily indicative of your like overall emotional strength or or fortitude and i think that uh you know i think that may has more emotional strength than me and less self-assurance because she has not accomplished as much yet in life and that for me i had basically no emotional strength whatsoever until the moment that I was able to feel good about myself for accomplishing something. And then, even then, that wasn't enough. Like, you know, Gay and Dead is obviously an album about me feeling like all these accomplishments and things I can brag about are not fulfilling me um, on a, a deep enough personal level to feel connection to myself, you know? So, like, those kinds of things are not things that made me feel good. You know, being able to provide for myself, being able to live... Uh, you know, being able to essentially be my own dad, you know, like, didn't make me happy. Um, it just made me feel like I was surviving, you know? And, like, I thought that as long as I could do those things for somebody else, then that would be enough. But, like, what, like, doing things, like, providing for May 
was not an effective manner of making May happy because she wants to be a provider. Like she gets something out of doing things for people. She gets something out of, you know, being the one who brings home the bacon, you know? Uh, and so like really it should never like, like what providing for May means is not, you know, like making all like doing all the work and, and having her rely on me. It's teaching her how to do the work so that she can be somebody who is relied on because that's what she wants to be, you know? So it's like, Understanding that and, you know, again, this comes down to like really understanding myself as like what my goal is, is essentially to to be a mother, to like be, you know, to, to fulfill the cultural role of a mother. And like that I understand that the reasons that I have found that so difficult is that culture does not value those things the way that it should. And it's not that they don't value it as in they don't respect it. Culture has plenty of respect for motherhood. But – you cannot like our our literally the structure of our society disincentivizes good mothering behaviors you know like you you literally cannot be the best kind of mother that you could be with a system that doesn't allow you the space to do that comfortably you know like uh so like i think that the more i appreciate what is needed from that role and the more I appreciate, like, how difficult it is, the more I feel like, oh, you know, like, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to, like, find this mothership in May so that I can know that it will be there. That, like, that my kid will have this mothership that I want them to have, that I want them to have it so, like, I, I, I mean, I can provide it, you know? So, like, if I want them to have it, I should be the one providing that. And, like... She should be providing what she wants to bring to the, the children herself, you know, be that a motherhood, a fatherhood, any kind of thing. You know, um, if there's something that our child needs that, you know, we that we can't provide through just the two of us, we need to find people who can and involve them, you know, and like you don't have to be sexually involved with someone for them to be somebody who, you know, helps you raise your parents. Obviously, lots of people have like midwives and like fucking uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, just like. Uh, nannies, you know, like people who who are there to help with whatever element of, you know, child rearing is, uh, <clears throat> you know, is not possible with just uh, the amount of you that is there. But like my 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 mentality is like whatever my kid needs to learn, I'm going to put them in the situation where they can learn that, you know, if I can't teach it or if we can't teach it, somebody can, you know, um, but they will be ex they will, you know, they will be safely exposed to perspectives and people who can, you know, teach them things that maybe I can't on my own, you know, that I can work with and not leave my kids with like some fucking, you know, school. <laughs> I don't know. My kids will probably go to school, but I don't know if they'll go to, I don't know. I don't know if they'll, I hope we can, like, May used to always like insist like, oh yeah, our kids are going to private school. And I, I was kind of like, I mean, I don't disagree with the notion, but it is like forty thousand dollars a year. So like, I don't know. Do you want Do you want me to make forty grand a year? Because like, I I could, but damn, like uh, <laughs> it's right next to me. I don't know if she hears what I'm talking about. No, she has no idea. Well, we're gonna move on to the next question anyways, because we're done with that one. And I gotta kill this fucking thing. Alright. Um, Tetra says, Not sure I should be commenting again. Already rambled at you a lot on Ep2, but I figured I ultimately... Uh, I figure ultimately you can just choose not to reply to comments or parts thereof that don't seem worth replying to, so up to you. I relate to a lot of what you've said about your experiences with lexicality versus impressionism across all three episodes. I've also le leaned into lexicality as a way to understand slash be understood by the world. Learning to indulge my more impressionistic emotional side has been good for me, but it largely seems vestigial. Rather than finding a deep impressionistic side that has been channeled into a lexical form as you have, it's more like I've discovered a dog living in my head and am learning to keep her happy. 
I'm not sure if I do have more impressionism in me, but it's buried more than yours, or if I'm just more attuned to slash better trained in lexicality. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas on how others might go either about either revealing their impressionistic side or training it, needing the approval of others and the ways that seeking lexical uh, certainty and lacking an emotional center contribute to that is an experience I find familiar. That's also a part of my motivation to want to improve my impressionistic side. I'm almost done with this, and I'm going to write a, a roll of blunt as soon as I'm done. So if you just want to grab, like, one nug that you want to smoke or whatever first, I can uh, oh. roll you well, right just, afterwards. I'm just going to do my meetup, so just... Oh, you're doing that in a second? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just roll right. for you. All right. Um, so, uh... <laughs> Anyway, she was like, like sitting there trying to figure out how much weed she wanted out of my, uh, the bag, and I was like, just give me like ten minutes. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, like I guess for for me, uh, because of the fact that, in spite of the fact that I've always been um, tasking myself to be lexical, I worship my own emotions, and like I, you know, I I care about my emotions more than my ability to be logical. It's like the logic, my ability to be logical is just a defense mechanism for my emotions, you know? I guess that's why, as I was saying, um, you know, that, like, I didn't connect to the masculinity except in that it could be, like, a, you know, a shield for me. So, like, I guess it's, like, uh, for me, like, the lack of desire to have been lexical in the first place is why I feel so, you know, powerful about the impressions that I have or, like, the impressionistic side of myself. Man, that sent me a ways back. Um, that death, I mean. But, uh, yeah, like, the... I, I think that, like, what you're describing, I feel similarly to that in certain areas. Like, when it comes to drawing pictures, like, I don't get ideas for drawings all the time. I don't particularly, like, see myself as somebody who wants to be specifically a visual artist as a career. But every once in a while, I have an impression that needs to be expressed visually. And even if I find it frustrating to make a drawing that I know is not going to be perfect, I, like, I need to do it because otherwise this this impression is not going to leave my brain you know and if i can even approximate it somewhat it might be satisfying maybe it won't maybe it will be maybe it will be emotionally like exhausting to to realize that i cannot do this drawing that i want to do but like at least i will experience an emotion and have a reaction as opposed to you know like a deliberate attempt to not do that so um yeah, I would say that, like, it, it, it's it's going to feel, at first, like you're just, like, keeping this thing happy. But eventually, you might realize that, like, like the more you learn about it, the more you can expand on it. You know, the more you feel comfortable uh, exploring it further or, you know, involving yourself deeper with that, uh, with that inner consciousness. Fuck all these flying guys, dude. Oh my god, there's a thousand of them. Shoot missiles at guy. Shoot missiles at guy. Strategy. Shoot missiles at guy. There we go. Alright, uh, last question of this episode is from NMNNM, who says, Digi, from my experience, girls are much more competitive than men. Oh, this is the one I, I already kind of answered this earlier. Uh, guys don't really... Uh, give a fuck other outside of professional sports yeah again i just think it's that like guys are more direct competitors girls are more like co like you know high concept competitors i guess um but uh again like i think that there is there's healthy and unhealthy competition between both men and women and that the kind of competition i'm in right now as a woman is the competition to see you know if i can be if I can live up to the people who I admire and uh, and and be better than the person who I've, you know, be better than the things that I've not liked about myself in the past, I guess, you know, and like address address what is causing me to act that way. Like, why am I behaving uh, in a way that like I, um, you know, why am I behaving in a way that, that causes me, that that, that, that 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 is untrue to my intentions? It's because I don't understand my intentions. Why don't I understand my intentions? Well, because you're avoiding understanding your intentions. Why are you avoiding it? Because you'll have to 
you know, you'll have to deal with feelings that you can't think of any reasons that you have. But like, there is a reason you have those feelings. There always is. Feelings don't come out of nowhere. They come out of somewhere. Um, you just need to, you know, it's not about like understanding why. It's about understanding how to move forward with. And, you know, that's, there's a lot of different forms that can take, but if you've tried one thing and it didn't work, try the next thing and keep trying until you find the one that makes you comfortable, you know? And, uh, in this case, I'm feeling the most comfortable I felt in, uh, my life. So I'm feeling pretty good about the changes I'm making. Um, I will say that I, I do think I'm overextending myself to, to be as open as possible to as many people as possible. Um, you know, and, uh, and like, I, I want to be back. I, I, I love being a human content machine because I love the interaction. I get so much out of it. It's hard for me to stop. But I also recognize that like there are places where I, you know, I cannot go, like, I can't just make nothing but befriending the internet all the time. And like, if I make one of these literally every day, there won't be time to do um, enough other things for me to, you know, for me to like live my life. So it's like, you know, what is the amount of work that I should be doing in the average day slash week? And, and, um, and how will that work best be reflected in the audience, um, getting something out of it, I guess is the question always on my mind. Anyway, that's it for this one. I'm going to go eat this bagel and smoke a blunt with May.